tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 3. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In tonight's special three-plus-hour-long episode, I'll be performing three stories for you, all from author Rebecca Klingle, perhaps better known by her original pen name, C.K. Walker about dastardly disappearances, criminal comeuppance, and cryptic calls, and including Rebecca's feature-length epic, Baraska, which is being made available freely to all my listeners tuning in tonight. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first terrifying tale. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes, with twice the terror. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight... As mentioned earlier, comes to us from author Rebecca Klingle, also known as C.K. Walker, who is currently working as a writer for Netflix's acclaimed series, The Haunting of Hill House. In this three-plus-hour-long feature-length tale, we'll meet Sam Walker, who has moved to the town of Drisking, Missouri, one summer and quickly befriends two local kids. Together, they take a trip to a strange treehouse, where you're tasked with carving your name on the tree or face disastrous consequences. Without further ado, I present to you Baraska. Part One It's a long story, but one you've never heard before. This story is about a place that dwells on a mountain. A place where bad things happen. And you may think you know about the bad things. You may decide you have it all figured out, but you don't. Because the truth is worse than monsters or men. At first I was upset when they told me we were moving to some little town out in the Ozarks. I remember staring at my dinner plate while I listened to my sister through a temper tantrum, unbefitting of a 14-year-old honor student. She cried, she pleaded, and then she cursed at my parents. She threw a bowl at my dad and told him it was all his fault. Mom told Whitney to calm down, but she stormed off, slamming every door in the house on her way to her room. I secretly blamed my dad as well. I'd heard the whispers, too. My dad had done something wrong, something bad and the sheriff's department had reassigned him to some little out-of-the-way county to save face. 
My parents didn't want me to know that, but I did. I was nine, so it didn't take me too long to warm to the idea of a change. It was like an adventure. New house, new school, new friends. Whitney, of course, felt the opposite. Moving to a new school at her age is hard. Moving away from her new boyfriend, however, was even harder. While the rest of us packed up our things and said our goodbyes, Whitney sulked and cried and threatened to run away from home. About a month later, when we pulled up to our new house in Drisking, Missouri, she was sitting right next to me, texting viciously on her phone. Thankfully, we moved over the summer, and I had months of free time to explore the town. When Dad started his new job at the sheriff's office, Mom drove us around the city, commenting on this and that. The city was much, much smaller than St. Louis, but also a lot nicer. There were no bad areas, and the entire town looked like something you'd see on a postcard. Drisking was built in a mountain valley, surrounded by healthy forest land with walking trails and crystal-clear lakes. I was nine, and it was summer, and this was in heaven. We'd only been living in Drisking a week or so, when our next-door neighbors came to introduce themselves. Mr. and Mrs. Landy and their ten-year-old son, Kyle. While our parents talked and drank mimosas, I watched Landy's lanky, red-headed son hung out in the doorway, shyly eyeing the PS2 in the living room. Uh, do you play? I asked. He shrugged. Uh, not really. Do you wanna? I just got Tekken 4. Hmm. Kyle glanced at his mom, who had just been handed her third mimosa. Yeah, sure. And that afternoon, with the ease and simplicity of our age, Kyle and I became best friends. We spent the cool summer mornings outside exploring the Ozarks, and the hot afternoons in my living room playing the PS2. He introduced me to the only other kid in the neighborhood our age, a skinny, quiet girl named Kimber DeStaro. She was shy but friendly, and always up for anything. Kimber kept up with us so well that she quickly became the third wheel on our tricycle. With my dad at work all the time, my mom consumed with her new friendships, and my sister locked in a room all day. The summer was ours to take, and take it we did. Kyle and Kimber showed me where all the best hiking trails were, which lakes were the best, and most accessible by bike, and where the best stores in town were. By the time the first day of school rolled around in September, I knew I was home. On the last Saturday before school started, Kyle and Kimber told me they were going to take me somewhere special, somewhere we hadn't been yet, the Triple Tree. What's a Triple Tree, I asked. That's totally awesome. Totally huge treehouse out in the woods, Kyle said excitedly. <laughs> Whatever, Kyle. Come on, you guys. If there was a freaking treehouse, you would have shown it to me already. Nuh-uh, we wouldn't have. Kyle shook his head. There's a ceremony for first-timers and everything. Kimber nodded eagerly in agreement, her dark orange curls bouncing off of her tiny shoulders. Yep, it's true, Sam. If you enter the treehouse without the proper ceremony, you'll disappear and then you'll die. My face fell. Now I knew they were making fun of me. That's a lie. You guys are lying to me. Oh, no, we're not, Kimber insisted. Yeah, we'll show you. We just have to get a knife for the ceremony and we'll go. What? Why do you need a knife? Is it a blood ceremony? I whispered. No way, Kimber promised. You just say some words and carve your name into the triple tree. Yep, it takes like one minute, Kyle agreed. And it's a really cool treehouse, I asked. Oh yeah, Kyle promised. Okay, I guess I'll do it then. Kyle insisted on using the same knife he used during his own ceremony, but we paid a price to get it. Mrs. Landry just happened to be home with her youngest son, Parker, 
and despite Kyle's many objections, his mother insisted he take his six-year-old brother with him. Mom, we're going to the treehouse. It's only for older kids. Parker can't go. I don't care if you're going to see an Exorcist movie marathon. You're taking your brother with you. I need a break, Kyle. Can't you understand that? And I'm sure your friends won't mind. He flashed Kimber and me a challenging look. Right? Uh, no, not at all, Kimber said. And I nodded in agreement. Kyle made a loud, dramatic sigh and called his brother. Parker, put your shoes on. We're leaving now. I'd met the youngest Landy several times before and found that he was unlike his older brother in looks as in disposition. For Kyle was a wild, excitable fireball with hair to match. I found Parker to be an anxious, fidgety boy with small eyes and dark brown hair. We got on our bikes and made our way to a lesser-known hiking trail a few miles away. I asked before where the trail led when we had ridden across it several weeks before, and Kyle had given me the underwhelming answer of nowhere interesting. We pulled up to the trailhead and leaned our bikes against the wooden signpost, which read, West Rim Prescott Or Trail. Why so many trails around here named Prescott? I asked. Is this Prescott Mountain or something? Kimber laughed. No, dummy. It's because of the Prescotts. You know, the, the family that lives in the mansion up on Fairmont? Mr. Prescott and his son Jimmy own like half the businesses in town. More than half, Kyle agreed. Which ones? Does he own the GameStop? The only store in Drisking I really cared about. I don't know about that one. Kyle wound a lock around the four bikes and clicked the bar in place. Then spun the numbers on the dial. But I'd like the hardware store, the, the pharmacy, Glitton's on second, and the newspaper. Did they start this town, I asked? Nah, mining started the town. I think they... I'm gonna go home. Parker had been so quiet, I'd completely forgotten he was there. You can't go home. Kyle rolled his eyes. Mom said I had to bring you. Now, come on, it's only like a two-mile walk. I want to take my bike, Parker answered. Too bad we're going off trail. I don't want to go. I'll stay with the bikes. Don't be such a wussy. I'm not. Kyle, be nice, Kimber hissed. He's only five. I'm six, Parker objected. I'm sorry, six. You're six. Kimber smiled at him. All right, fine. He can hold your hand if he wants. But he's coming. Kyle turned and started up the trail. Parker's face fell into an undignified frown, but when the charming Kimber stuck out her hand and wiggled her fingers at him, he took it. Kyle was right. It wasn't a long walk. Only a half mile down the trail, then another half mile hike on a well-tread path up the mountain. It was a steep climb, though, and by the time we got to the treehouse, I was winded. What do you think? Kyle asked excitedly. It's... I studied the tree as I caught my breath. It's pretty awesome. I smiled, and it was. They hadn't lied to me. The treehouse was the biggest one I'd ever seen. It had multiple rooms, and there were actual curtains in the windows. The sign above the door said, Ambercott Fort, and a rope ladder hung below the threshold, missing several planks. I'm going up first, yelled Parker, but Kimber caught his arm. You have to do the ceremony first, or you'll disappear, she reminded him. Well, that'd be fine with me. Kyle grumbled. I was eager to get into the fort myself. Give me the knife. I held up my hand, and Kyle smiled and dug the switchblade out of his pocket. There's some space in the back to carve your name. I opened up the knife and walked around the tree looking for an empty spot. They were so many names on the trunk that I had to crunch down and look and search near the bottom since I couldn't reach any higher. I spotted both Kyle and Kimber's carvings on the tree and I found a spot I liked near the ladder. 
I bit my tongue and carved Sam W. into a blank piece of bark underneath someone named Phil S. Parker went next, but had so much trouble with the knife that Kyle ended up doing it for him. All right, let's go. I ran over to the rope ladder. Wait, Kyle yelled. You have to say the words first. Oh, yeah, what are they? Kimber sung them out. Underneath the triple tree, there's a man who waits for me. And should I go or should I stay? My fate's the same either way. That's creepy, I said. What does it mean? Kimber shrugged. No one knows anymore. It's just tradition. Okay, can you say it one more time, slower? Once Parker and I had managed to recite the poem without forgetting the words, we were ready to go. I climbed the rope ladder first and took stock of my new surroundings. The treehouse was more or less empty. Just a dirty rung here and there and some trash. Old soda cans, beer cans, and fast food wrappers. I went room to room, four in total, and found nothing of real interest until I entered the last one. An old mattress lay in the corner and piles of musty, ripped clothing scattered the floor. The hobo live here? I asked. Nah, this room's been like this for as long as I can remember. Kyle said from the doorway behind me. Smells gross, I said. Kimber walked up to the threshold but refused to go any further. It's not the smell that freaks me out. It's that. She pointed up to the ceiling and I raised my eyes to read what was written there. Road to the Gates of Hell. Mile marker one. What's that mean? I asked. It's just some Older kids be dicks, Kyle said. Come on, I'll show you the best part of the treehouse. We walked back into the first room, and Parker looked up at us and smiled, pointing down to what he clumsily carved into the wooden floor. Fart, Kyle read. That's hilarious, Parker. He rolled his eyes, and his little brother smiled proudly. Kimber sat down on the floor next to Parker, and I sat on his other side. Kyle took the knife from his brother and then walked across the room and wedged the blade between two planks of the wooded wall. Applied a slight pressure, and the board gave, opening up a small secret compartment in the wall. Kyle took something out and pushed the plank back in until it was again flush with the wall. Check it out. He turned around and proudly held two cans of Miller Lite beer. Whoa! Ew, warm beer. That's gross. How did you even know it was there? Kimber asked. Phil Sanders told me. Are we going to drink it? I asked. Oh, yeah, we're going to drink it. Kyle came on and sat down in our circle, popped open the first beer and offered it to Kimber. She recoiled as if she was being handed her a dirty diaper. Come on, Kimmy. Don't call me that, she yelled at him, then reluctantly took the open beer. She smelled it and made a face, then pinched her nose and took a small swig. Kimber shuddered. Oh, that was even grosser than I imagined. I don't want any. I'll tell Mom. Parker said quickly as the beer passed in front of him. Good, cause you ain't getting any. Kyle promised, and you won't tell Mom shit. I put on my best poker face and took a long, deep swallow of the warm beer before I had a chance to smell it. It was a poor decision, and when I retched, the foul yellow liquid went all over my shirt. Oh, man, now I'm going to smell like beer. We spent the next hour and a half drinking the two cans of Miller Lite, and after a while, the taste seemed to grow more tolerable. I couldn't tell if I was becoming a man, or actually getting drunk. I hoped it was the former. When the last drop of the last beer was consumed, we spent twenty minutes trying to determine if we were drunk. Kyle assured us that he was wasted, while Kimber wasn't sure. I didn't think I was, but I failed all of our makeshift drunk tests. Kimber was in the middle of reciting the alphabet backwards 
when a loud metallic grinding suddenly pierced the balmy mountain air like a gunshot. Kimber stopped talking, and we spent a few minutes staring at each other, waiting for the noise to end. Parker curled into Kimber and put his hand over his ears. After what seemed like ten whole minutes, the sound ended as suddenly as it had begun. What was that? I asked, and Parker mumbled something into Kimber's T-shirt. Do you guys know? I tried again. Kimber stared at her kids as she crossed and uncrossed her feet. Well? It's nothing, Kyle answered finally. We hear it sometimes in town. It's not a big deal, it's just louder up here. But what's making that sound? Baraska. Kimber whispered without taking her eyes off her kids. Who's that? I asked. Not who, where? Kyle answered, it's a place. Another town? No, just a place in the woods. Oh. Bad things happen there. Kimber said more to herself than anyone else. Like what? Bad things. Kimber repeated. Yeah, don't ever try to find it, dude. Kyle said behind me. Or bad things will happen to you, too. But, like, what bad things? Kyle shrugged, and Kimber stood up and walked over to the rope ladder. We better go. I have to get home to my mom, she said. We climbed down the ladder one by one, then started to walk back to the trailhead in an unfamiliar silence. I was dying of curiosity about Baraska, but couldn't decide if and what to ask about it. So who lives there? Where? Kyle asked. Baraska. The skinned man, Parker answered, and the shiny gentleman. <laughs> Kyle laughed. Only babies believe that. Like men who are skinned? Like their skin is gone? I asked excitedly. Yeah, that's what some kids say. Most of us stopped believing in that, though, uh, when we turned double digits. Kyle said and shot an exasperated look at Parker. I looked back at Kimber for confirmation, but she was still staring down at the trail, ignoring us. That seemed to be the end of the conversation, and by the time we reached our bikes, the awkwardness had abated, and we were giggling as we tried to decide if we were too drunk to bike home. School started two days later, and by that time, I'd completely forgotten about Baraska. When my dad pulled up to the curb to drop me off that morning, he locked the doors before I could get out. Not so fast, he laughed. As your father, I get the privilege of giving you a hug and telling you to have a good first day of school. But, Dad, I gotta go meet Kyle by the flag before first bell. And you will, but just give me a hug first. In a few years, you'll be driving yourself to school. Let me be your dad while I still can. Fine, I said. And leaned over to give my dad a quick hug. Thank you. Now go meet Cal. Your mom will be waiting here to pick you up at 3.40. I know, Dad. But why can't I take the bus like Whitney? When you're 13, you can take the bus. He smiled and unlocked the doors. Until then, I get to drop you off in the mornings. If you think it'd make you look cooler, you can ride in the back seat behind the cage. Dad, just don't. I threw open the door of the cruiser before he could say anything more and slammed the door on his amused laughter. Kyle was already waiting for me at the flagpole with Kimber, looking around nervously. Dude, you almost missed the bell. He yelled at me when he saw me. I know, sorry. Whose class are you in? Kimber asked. She was wearing a red sweater and leggings with frogs on them. Her curly orange hair was brushed into ringlets, and her lips were pink and shiny. She'd never looked more feminine, and I was surprised to realize I'd never really seen Kimber as a girl. Uh, Mr. Diamonds. Me too, she said cheerfully. Lucky, Kyle scoffed. I'm in Mrs. Tverdy's. Only two sixth-grade teachers, and I get the crappy one. Kimber grimaced. Yeah, my mom had her when she was a kid. 
What's wrong with her? What did your mom say? Just that she's strict and gives out homework on the weekends. On the weekends? Fuck. Excuse me, Mr. Landy. I immediately recognized the tall man that had suddenly appeared behind the white-faced Kyle. So sorry, sir. I mean, dang. Kimber giggled. I'm sure you did, he nodded. Hi, Sheriff Clary. Even though I'd only met him a few times, I liked my dad's boss. I think he liked me. Oh, hello, Sammy. Are you excited for your first day? Sheriff Clary crossed his arms in front of him and widened his stance imposingly, but gave me a wide smile. Yes, sir, I said, and then added lamely, What are you doing here? I'm giving a presentation to the third and fourth graders about safety when walking to and from school. Yeah, he gives it every year. Kyle muttered, Cool, I smiled. Sheriff Clary nodded at me and then turned and walked away. I turned to Kimber to find an empty space that smelled slightly of strawberries. Where's Kimber? She took off. She's annoyingly on time to everything. And as if to illustrate his point, the bell rang. We both ran up the stairs and inside the doors. I walked into class and smiled when I saw that Kimber had saved me a spot next to her at the back. Mr. Diamond, a short round man of forty or so, nodded at me when I came in. Mr. Walker, I presume? Uh, yeah, that's me. I mumbled as I rushed past him to the desk next to Kimber. Welcome to Drisking Elementary. And for the rest of you, welcome back. Go Grizzlies. The class echoed a reluctant and subdued, uh, Go Grizzlies. Throughout the morning, Kimber introduced me to the other kids in her class. Most of them were nice, if sort of underwhelmed by me. They said their hellos and asked where I was from, and the conversations usually ended with an unimpressed, Okay. A group of girls who sat near the front snuck looks at us all morning and snickered to themselves. I asked Kimber who they were, and she just shrugged. During our second break, they managed to accost me at the pencil sharpener. Are you friends with Kimber de Style? The tall, dark-haired girl asked me. Yeah. I answered and looked over at Kimber. She was watching me with worried eyes. Are you related to her? No. I didn't think so because you don't have orange hair. I didn't know what to say to that. You don't have to be friends with her, you know said the second girl with the oddly round face. I want to be friends with her. The third girl, looking behind the other two, snorted. She had pretty auburn hair and a rude upturned nose. Well, if you do, you're going to be very unpopular here. The first girl warned. And once you're in that group, you can't ever leave it. Eh, better than the bitch group, I said. Rude nose and round face gasped, but dark hair smiled. We'll see, she said, and the three returned to the corner of the classroom and continued whispering to each other. I sat back down next to Kimber and continued what I'd been writing as if nothing had happened. What did you say to them? Kimber asked nervously. They said you are too pretty to be in either of them and that you made them look ugly in comparison. They'd like us to stay away from them. <laughs> Liar, Kimber answered, but I could hear the smile in her voice. We met Kyle in the cafeteria at lunch and listened to him artfully complain about his morning. Mrs. Tverdy was ancient and cruel, and she made every kid in the class stand up and say something about themselves, even though her room consisted of only 14 kids who'd all known each other since preschool. When the bell rang for recess, Kyle and I walked over to throw our lunches away. I threw the tray on top of the can and turned around, slamming into some kid I'd never seen before. Oh, uh, sorry, I mumbled, as Kyle laughed at me. Wait, are you Sam Walker? The kid asked. Yeah. Oh, your sister's dating my brother. 
Oh, man, Kyle laughed. Your sister's dating a Whittaker. Shut up, Kyle. The kid snapped. She's going to be Whitney Whittaker. As funny as it was, I couldn't help but be a little surprised. Not that I'd been paying much attention, but I'd only seen Whitney out of her room a couple of times over the entire summer. Um, where'd she meet him? I asked the Whittaker kid. I don't know, probably at his job. His job? Where? He works at Drisking Water. It didn't make any sense to me, but I shrugged it off. I did remember my mom giving Whitney some menial tasks, like getting the car washed and setting up some utilities to get her out of the house. Maybe she met him once and they started dating over text. Teenagers were weird. The rest of the school week followed much like the first day. We were well into the first month before I heard someone mention the skinned man again. We were out in the playground, and Kyle and I were trying to start a fire with two large wood chips. I'd just given myself a splinter when the distant sound of metal grinding on metal flooded onto the playground, silencing every one of us. Baraska. I said, nah. Yep, said Phil Sanders. The skinned men kill again. Kyle said only little kids believed in skin men. I threw an accusatory look at Kyle. They do. Phil's just stupid. Screw you. Why don't you ask Danielle? She's seen them. Phil scanned the playground and yelled at a blonde girl talking to Rude Nose. Hey, Danielle, come here. The blonde girl rolled her eyes but came skipping over anyway. What do you want? I already told you Kalo doesn't like you, Philip. No, tell them about the skinned men. Phil gestured to the air around us, which was filled with the metallic scraping coming down from the mountains. Why don't you tell them? Because you saw them and I didn't. I didn't see them. Paige saw them. Oh, Phil said, and an uncomfortable silence descended. You guys are weird, Danielle said before flipping her hair in our faces and leaving. Who's Paige? I asked when she'd gone. Her sister, Phil said. Paige disappeared when we were like five, Kyle said. After she saw the skinned men, Phil added. The sounds from the mountain abruptly ended, and the subdued atmosphere of the playground disappeared with it. When the bell rang, we lined up with our respective classes. Since Phil was in my class, I made sure I was behind him. The teachers began to count us off. Hey, what else do you know about Baraska? I whispered to him. My brother said that's where people go when they disappear. To Baraska to meet the shiny gentleman. What happens to them there? Bad things. He said, and then he shushed me when I asked him what he meant. The year dragged on, and it wasn't until Christmas break that I heard the machine at Baraska again. It was December, and there was a thick blanket of snow on the ground, which only served to amplify the noise from the mountain. I sat in my room, listening to it for a few minutes, trying to decide what was happening in the place that bad things happened. I saw my dad's cruiser pull up out the window and went downstairs to meet him. As I passed my sister's door, I heard her giggling in that annoying teenage girl way, and I cringed. I hope Kimber never got like that. Hi, Dad, I said to him as he opened the door. My dad stomped the snow off his boots and smiled up at me. Sammy, how many years has it been? He joked. It was true I hadn't seen much of my dad lately, since he was working so much. Doing what? I didn't know, since this was the quietest, lamest town ever. Mom thought the sheriff was grooming Dad for his job, since Clary was so old, and Dad never really agreed or disagreed with her. He'd only been at the department seven months, after all, and my dad doubted people in the county would vote for him. Feels like about six this time, I laughed. But, eh, do you hear that noise in the distance? That 
like machine sounding noise? Yeah, I hear that in town every now and then, too. Do you know what it is? You know, I asked the sheriff the same question, and he told me that noise is coming from private property up in the Ozarks. Is the property called Baraska? I asked quickly. I have no idea. Baraska? Where'd you hear that? I shrugged. Eh, kids in my school. Well, that's nothing to worry about, Sammy. Probably just some logging equipment. But it's a place called Baraska. Like, have you heard that name before? No, I have not heard that name before. Dad pulled his boots off and shrugged off his coat, looking toward the kitchen. I could tell I was losing him. Have you ever heard of the skinned men? I asked quickly. Skinned men? Good God, Sam. Is your sister telling you these stories? No, but he wasn't listening to me anymore. Whitney! He yelled up the stairs. No, Dad. Whitney doesn't even talk to me, I repeated. I heard the door creak open upstairs, and Whitney peered over the railing, phone in hand, and an annoyed look on her face. Are you trying to scare your brother? Dad demanded. Dad, no, I said again. Whitney shot me a venomous look. Oh, seriously? As if I'd waste my time? You aren't telling him stories about skinned men. No, Dad. I told you I heard it at school, I said. Whitney gestured to me as if to say, See? All right, well, you kids really need to start getting along anyway. Your family, for Christ's sakes. Whitney rolled her eyes, and when Dad walked into the kitchen, she stuck her tongue out at me. Oh, real mature, Whitney. I yelled up at her, but she was already gone. I'll tell Dad about your boyfriend. Christmas came and went with surprising smoothness at our house. Whitney and I got almost everything we'd had on our list, which was a first for us. The town may be smaller, but Dad's paychecks were clearly bigger. I wore my new Rams parka on the first day back to school after Christmas break. Kyle fawned over it, and Kimber showed off a blue pearl necklace her mom had gotten her for Christmas. Kyle and I feigned interest, but it did poorly. Kimber knew, but just seemed happy we cared enough to fake it. As we said goodbye to Kyle for the morning, Kimber was suddenly slammed from the side. Kyle caught her before she fell, and I spun around angrily to see dark-haired girl, whose name I learned was Phoebe Dranger, laughing and walking away from us with round face. You guys are assholes, Kyle yelled at them. When I'm your boss someday, I'll make you clean the bathrooms. Yeah, and if Kyle's your boss, you know you messed up, I added. Kyle and I high-fived and turned to Kimber, but she wasn't impressed with us. I could tell she was trying to hide her tears in her scarf. Don't sweat those girls, Kimber. Nobody likes them. People are just nice to them because they're related to the Prescotts. Kyle tried to give her an awkward pat on the back, but Kimber turned away from him and ran in the opposite direction. I hate those girls. Like, I really hate them, I said. And no, they're bitches. Kyle agreed. Well, I better get to class and make sure they don't try and talk to her again. There's an assembly this morning. No class until after lunch. Seriously? That's awesome. Do we have to sit by class? I don't think so, but we better get there quick so we can get seats at the back, Kyle said as we started walking. What's the assembly for, I asked. It's either D.A.R.E. or the Historic Society presentation. What's D.A.R.E.? You know, D.A.R.E. As in, don't you dare do drugs or you're grounded until you're dead. Oh, I hope it's the history thing, then. We found Kimber already in the auditorium. She'd collected herself and saved us both seats at the back of the room. She waved us over just as the puffy stern Mrs. Tverdy walked onto the stage. Everybody, please quiet down. This morning, we have a special presentation for you from the History Preservation Society of Drisking. If you have questions during the course of the lecture, please raise your hand. Like that'll happen. 
Kyle laughed. Now I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Wyatt Dowding, Mrs. Catherine Scanlon, and of course, Mr. James Prescott. What? Jimmy Prescott? Not his dad? That's so weird, Kimber whispered. Dude, Thomas Prescott has done this presentation every year for like 20 years, Kyle said. It's definitely weird. It's not weird. Patrick Sutton whispered from behind us. He leaned forward. Tom Prescott went crazy like a year ago. He didn't do the presentation last year when my sister was here either. I don't like Jimmy Prescott. Kimber shook her head. He gives me the eebie-jeebies. His dad's so much nicer. He's like a grandpa. The presentation was as slow and as boring as it possibly could be. Mr. Dowding and Ms. Scanlon talked about the first settlers here, the Cherokee and the Trail of Tears. They talked about Alexander Drisking's discovery of a mother load of ore in the mountains and settling here with his family to mine and refine the ore. Then James Prescott took the stage from there to tell the story of his family's early journey to the town and their role in the revitalization of Drisking itself in the late 50s. Prescott's story was the first interesting thing I'd heard all morning, and I found Jimmy Prescott to be affably charismatic and entertaining. I was so busy laughing at his jokes and absorbing his stories that by the end of the presentation, I realized I'd actually learned quite a bit, so much so that I was interested enough to ask a question, which Kyle quickly warned me was social suicide. Mr. Prescott scanned the room and answered a few other questions before he finally got to me in the back. Yes, the young man in the blue shirt. Um, Mr. Prescott, why did the mines close? Are there any still working? I asked. That's a very good question. What did you say your name was? Uh, Sam Walker. Oh, I believe I met your father the other day at the sheriff's office. Welcome to Drisking. As for your questions, most of the mines were closed in 1951 after a long period of unprofitability. The mountains had simply run out of iron ore. The mills and refineries were abandoned, and the town suffered for years. The miners and their families moved away, stores went out of business, schools closed, and Drisking became a ghost town, as I was explaining before. That would have been the end of it if it weren't for stubborn families like mine who refused to leave. We refused to give up on the town, and after many, many, many years of hard work, Drisking became the picturesque little haven in the Ozarks that it is today. As for your second question, yes, I believe there may still be one mine in operation. Good questions. Anyone else? I sat back down, and Kyle shook his head at me. Bro. The assembly suffered through another fifteen minutes of awkward Q&A until Miss Ferdy finally cut us loose. We were released into the cafeteria to wait for the lunch lines to open. Kyle, Kimber, and I sat in our usual corner. That was so boring. Kyle whined. When are they going to realize that no one cares about Drisking's history. Seriously, I fell asleep like three times. Kimber nudged me. Sam seemed to care, she teased. I just wanted to know about the mines. Mines are creepy, that's all. Yeah, but all our mines were blown up. Can't go in them anymore, Kyle said. Blown up, I asked. Kimber nodded. Some kids died after going into the mines... So the city set them some control blasts to implode the caverns, or at least that's what my mom said. They messed up, though, and I heard they blew up the water table or poisoned it or something. What? How do you know that? Kyle asked. Kimber shrugged. I heard my dad talking about it. Did they use C4 or something? I guess. So, like, we all drink the water, so we all have C4 in our bodies, and we could explode at any minute, Kyle said excitedly. Do you think that's what happened to all those missing people? 
I asked him. Just sitting there one day and boom. Yeah, dude. Kyle grabbed my shoulders. And that's where the skin men come from. I made the popular gesture of mind blown and he laughed hysterically. You guys are dumb. Kimber rolled her eyes, but then she laughed when Kyle fell on the floor, pretending he was exploding. I remember thinking in that moment that I was happy here in Drisking, Missouri with these two people. Happier than I'd ever been anywhere else. It was truly the last moment of joy I ever had. Less than an hour later, Mr. Diamond's phone rang, and he exchanged a few quiet words with the person on the other end, his eyes flicking to and from my desk. It was hard to be surprised then, when he hung up and he asked me to come up to the front. He quietly told me that my mom was waiting for me in the office, and I was going home for the day. I traded a confused and worried look with Kimber, and then packed up my backpack and went to the office. When I got there, my mom was crying. We drove home in a strained silence. I was too afraid to ask what was wrong. Mom stopped the car about a block from our house, which was blocked in by several police cars. When an explanation wasn't forthcoming, I broke the silence myself. Is it Dad? I asked quietly. No, honey. Dad's fine. She whispered. Then what is it? Whitney. Whitney never made it to school this morning. Her voice broke over my sister's name. Oh, I said. Oh, wait. I think she ditched, Mom. I actually saw her leave this morning, and it was really early, like six, and she was with her friends. Um, Pete Whittaker and that kid Taylor. We know all about that, Sam. But they made it to school, and Whitney wasn't with them. They said she wanted to stop by the Circle K near Drisking High, so they left her there. And no one has seen her since. Well, my brain struggled to come up with an explanation. Maybe she's ditching. No, honey. My mom put the car back in drive and drove up to our house, parking behind a police cruiser. The police, as well as your father, think that Whitney is with Jay. But she has a new boyfriend here. We found all her books on the floor of her room this morning, and half her clothes gone along with some of cash uh, of your dad's. But right now we think that she hitched a ride to St. Louis and that she's with Jay. The sheriff's office is trying to contact the boy's parents now. Whitney, run away? Anyone who knew my sister knew she was prone to dramatics and empty threats. Plus, she was dating Chris Whitaker's older brother, Pete. I was sure of it. We walked up the steps and into a house of stale coffee and quiet murmurs. I tried to remember if Whitney herself had ever actually confirmed she was dating Pete, but I drew a blank. When we walked into the kitchen, I saw my father sitting at a table staring at phone records, hand in hand. He looked up when I came into the room and gave me a weak smile. Hey, buddy. Dad, I have to tell you something. I felt a heavy hand on my shoulder and turned to look up at a solemn Sheriff Clary. Everything and anything you might know, son, no matter how trivial you think it is. I nodded and sat down at the table with my dad as my mom handed the big man a cup of coffee. Here you go, Sheriff. And she said weakly, Please, Mrs. Walker, call me Killian. My mother nodded and retreated back into a darkened corner to talk quietly with Sheriff Clary's wife, Grace. What do you know, Sam? My dad asked as he rested his chin on his interlaced hands. Well, just... I heard Whitney had a boyfriend, that guy, Pete Whittaker, that she'd been hanging around with, and I saw them and Taylor Dranger leave this morning before me. What time did they leave? asked the sheriff. I don't know, like, like before seven. He nodded. Well, that matches the statements of Taylor Dranger and the Whittaker boy. 
My father's head sunk lower into his hands, and I knew I'd let him down. But I rushed. I don't think she went back to St. Louis because she was dating Pete, and I don't think she wanted to be with her boyfriend back home anymore. I understand that, Sam. But a teenage girl's mind is a complicated thing. My officers are trying to get a hold of the boyfriend's family back in St. Louis. Clary nodded to my father. Now, why don't you head up to your room and let us work, Samuel? I looked up at him in surprise. What? No, I want to stay down here and help. No, son, there's nothing more you can do here. You've been a good brother. Now, let us handle this. But I can help. You already have. Dad, I looked over at my dad with begging eyes. Go to your room, Sam. He said quietly after a moment. I balked. Dad? Now. I was so angry. I turned away from them in a rage and stomped upstairs, slammed the door behind me when I got to my room. I sat down on my bed in disbelief. The tears came then, and I laid down feeling helpless, worthless, and scared for my sister. I thought about the places Whitney could be. Was she scared? Was she alone? Was she dead? When the sun began to set, I finally got out of bed and went to check my email. I was expecting lots of messages from Kimber and Kyle, but there was only one. Did Whitney go to the treehouse? I sat staring at the computer screen for a long time. Kimber's words from last fall tumbling around in my brain. If you enter the treehouse... Without the proper ceremony, you'll disappear and then you'll die. I didn't buy that Whitney had gone to Circle K that morning, and I especially didn't believe that she'd hitchhiked out of town. Nothing they were saying downstairs made any sense if you knew my sister. But maybe this did. Maybe she and her boyfriend went to the treehouse to make out or something. Maybe he'd left her there. Maybe she'd gotten lost, or maybe the skinned men had found her. That was the worst thought of all. I didn't need to sneak out because the police were too busy with my parents to care about me anyway. I snuck my bike out of the garage and rode the three miles to the West Rim Prescott Ore Trail. When I got there, I was surprised and relieved to see two bikes already locked to the signpost and my two best friends sitting in the snow next to them. I knew you'd come, Kyle said when I pulled up to them, and Kimber jumped up to hug me. I'm so sorry, Sam. There was really nothing for me to say, and they didn't push. Kimber took my arm, and we started up the trail. The silence between us was stretched but comfortable. We trudged through the snow, and all the while, I searched for the telltale shoe prints of Whitney's wretched Ugg boots, but the snow was coming too fast to see. The hike up the mountain was harder and wetter than we'd come in the fall, and when Embercott Fort finally came into view over the ridge, it was a welcome sight. The sun was getting low, and we hadn't brought flashlights. I stumbled as I ran up to the tree, calling my sister's name in the quiet wild. Cal was right behind me and leapt impressively onto the rope ladder, climbing quickly up the planks. I kept calling Whitney's name, waiting for Kyle to yell that he'd found her or some sign of her. And then Kimber quietly said my name from where she stood at the triple tree. I ran over and followed her finger to what I already knew was there. I found it freshly carved near the top. Whitney W. My breath froze in my chest and my vision blurred with unwelcome tears. And as the sun took its last desperate breath before plunging into the deep of the horizon, a deafening metallic whirl rang out from the wilderness and spilled down the mountainside. Part 2 Underneath the triple tree there's a man who waits for me. And should I go or should I stay? My fate's the same either way. 
Good morning. And the words faded back into the ether, and I awoke with a start. Jimmy Prescott was lounging against the wall near the door, an amused yet slightly disapproving look on his face. Shim. Sorry, Mr. Prescott. I didn't hear you come in. You know, I worked here when I was a kid, too, Sam. I installed a bell on the front door for this very reason. Didn't seem to wake you up, though. He laughed. I mumbled another apology and idly straightened a stack of business cards in front of me. Late night? No, oh, kind of. Very. I hope you weren't out at the bonfires with all the other underage drinkers. No, sir. <laughs> Fucking course. Good. Anyway, I'm just here for my lunch. I'll take a Parmesan chicken with avocado on rye. Yes, sir. Happy that the conversation was over, I walked over to the sandwich counter and unwound the twisty tie from the rye bread. Jimmy Prescott stepped back from the counter and idly studied the pictures on the wall, though I knew he'd seen them a thousand times before. Most of the photos were of the Prescott family, taken over the last half century. I'd always thought it odd decor, but then the shop did belong to the Prescotts, after all. Is Mira here? Prescott asked as I wrapped up his sandwich. She's in the back. Ah, I thought she'd still be in St. Louis. Well, when you're finished, would you mind getting her for me? Shit. Yes, sir. I handed him his sandwich and went to the back to find my boss. She was in the office, furiously punching keys on her accounting calculator. Uh, Mir? Jimmy Prescott's out front. He wants to talk to you. She turned and gave me a dubious look. Did he say what about? I shook my head. Okay, she sighed. You can go home for the day, Sam. Oh, are, are you sure? We still had three hours in the clock. He's the only customer we've had since we opened. Don't worry, I'll pay you for the whole day, kiddo. Thanks, Mara. Um, good luck, I guess. I gave her a sympathetic shrug, and she patted my arm. I don't know how she did it. Mira was perhaps the most burdened and stressed-out woman and all of Drisking, but she never failed to be unbelievably kind. There was a hopelessness about her, a sadness that she didn't hide very well. I left the store out the back door so I wouldn't have to see Jimmy Prescott again. His weird yellow-amber eyes always set me on edge, not to mention he was a total tool. I hopped in my car and texted Kyle that it was off work. He answered immediately and told me where to meet him. I happily whipped my apron off over my head and threw the car into reverse. Crystal Lake was my favorite place in all of Drisking. I had to park almost a mile away since the lake was so packed. I eventually found Kyle and Kimber sitting on a rock that jutted out over the beach. Kimber was sunbathing in a blue floral bikini, and Kyle was wearing his you can't tell where my eyes are looking, sunglasses. What did I miss? I asked, sitting down next to Kimber. Not much. She answered, stretching and sitting up. Just more beer. She dug into the cooler behind her and tried to hand me a blue moon. Uh, no. I waved it away. Got any excedrin? Oh, no. Kimber gave me her pitying pout. Okay, then I'll just take these sunglasses. I held up my hand to Kyle, who looked back at it in horror. What? No, fuck off. Oh, come on, Kyle. Give me your sunglasses. Sam didn't get to sleep off his hangover like we did. I smiled at Kyle, and he tightened his lips. We both knew exactly what I was doing. Kimber stroked Kyle's arms in encouragement. Please? She asked. Fine, he said, and shoved his blue blockers at me. I put them on and sat back, turning my head to watch the girls on the beach below. Phoebe Dranger, the dark-haired girl, was there lying on a towel next to Roundface and giggling. 
It still seemed unnatural to me to see the two of them without rude nose. Those three had been inseparable for years, working as fluidly together as the gears and the watch until Christy had fallen in love with some college kid and run away. So, why'd you get off work early? Anyway, Kyle asked. Prescott came in. Ooh. Kimber squirmed. He totally freaks me out. He's been staring at me since, like, seventh grade. Next time he stares at you, let me know and I'll knock him the fuck out. Kyle had been protective over Kimber, but ever since they'd started dating, he'd gotten ten times more unbearable. Kimber winked at him. So what do you want, Sam? He wanted to talk to Mira. Probably about the shop. You mean about how no one goes there and the business should have closed years ago? But it won't because the Prescotts are stubborn and vain? Kyle said. Yeah, probably. I mean, she looked pretty worried. I can literally count on one hand how many sandwiches I've sold in the past month. Ouch. Kimber grimaced. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she's going to get chewed out. I really don't like that guy. I thought about the squirmy, yellow-eyed freak yelling at the sweet, kind-hearted Mira, and it made my blood boil. I should have met his dad, Carl snorted. He was a piece of work. His dad? Yeah, Tom Prescott, Kimber said. The family put him in a home a few towns over. Really? Why is he in a home? I asked. I heard that he got dementia and was embarrassing the family in public, Kyle said. I heard that, too. Kimber brushed her long curls off of her shoulders. I always liked Tom Prescott. It was a pretty shitty thing to do. Hey, kids! We turned in unison to see Phil Saunders come stomping out of the bushes behind us with Patrick Sutton following behind. So this is where the cool people hang out, high above the kingdom on Pride Rock. Sup, Patrick? Kyle said, ignoring Phil, whom he disliked ever since Phil had briefly dated Kimber. Phil was either unaware of or uninterested in Kyle's feelings. Of course, it may also have been because Phil was stoned out of his mind most of the time, and today was no exception. They sat down next to us, and Patrick offered me his pipe. Want to hit this? I did want to hit it, and pretty badly, too. I reached up to grab it, but Phil swatted my hand away. Careful, guy. You don't want to get that sheriff's son high. For fuck's sake, Patrick. Patrick nodded knowingly and shoved the pipe back into his pocket. I scowled. Really? Sorry, Sammy. Hell, the only reason I'm even smoking around you is because today is my cousin's death anniversary. I don't give a shit about anything else. Cousin Hannah? Kimber asked with a sympathetic look. Yep, five years she's been gone. Too many people disappear in these woods, man. Patrick said as he exhaled a cloud of smoke. Yeah, man, Phil nodded. You know, sometimes when I'm high, I can see them all. And I feel like I know the answer to the mystery, man. Like I'm so close to solving it. It's just something I can see. Like they're all puzzle pieces, and in my mind I see the puzzle put together, but I can't tell you what the picture is of, you know? You're fucking high, Saunders. Kyle said. We all high, man. We all high. Everyone in this town is drinking the fucking Kool-Aid. Kimber raised an eyebrow at him but said nothing. Everyone except the dead ones. I can see what they looked like before they went into the ground. Or is it the grounder? Shit's fucked up, Phil. Patrick said to the space in front of him. Yeah, I see all these people. Hannah, Paige, Jason Medley, Hell... I even see your sister, Walker. Kyle, who I knew had been monitoring the conversation for any mention of Whitney, sprang to his feet and opened his mouth to yell at Phil. Nah, 
The Walker girl ran away to St. Louis, remember? Patrick said before he could. I saw Kyle and Kimber exchange a quick look as I tried to remain impassive from behind the blue blockers. That true, man? Phil asked. And there it was. I knew Kyle and Kimber had always wondered what I thought about Whitney and if I'd ever accepted the official statement that she and Jay had run away together. They were kind enough not to bring it up, but I knew they wanted to know what I believed and what I thought had really happened. I loved them both, and I wanted to talk to them about it, but I just couldn't. Everyone thought that I had spent the last five years quietly grieving and that I'd put the pain behind me. At least, that's what I tried to show them had happened. The truth was, I'd never given up on Whitney. I'd waited years for Jay to show up on social media, and when I finally found him last year, I'd been devastated. I'd always hoped the official report was true, and that Whitney was somewhere far away from here, alive and happy with Jay Bauer. But his Facebook page showed a thriving college kid still on good terms with his parents, his ex-girlfriend, Whitney, the furthest thing from his mind. When I'd brought the evidence to my dad, he'd read the pages I'd printed off and then shut the door to his office with me on the other side. I heard him crying in there for hours as I waited for word that he'd reopened the case and was bringing the smackdown on the Butler County Sheriff's Department. But he emerged hours later his face dry in all business. Justice had never come. We never mentioned Jay Bauer again. For whatever reason, I never told Kyle and Kimber about the incident. Maybe it was because I was worried they'd blow it off like my dad had, or maybe, far more likely, I didn't want them to know how obsessed they'd become with Baraska and the skinned men. I knew, as assuredly as the sun would rise tomorrow, that Whitney's death had happened there, just like all the others who'd gone to the triple tree. I was suddenly very aware of four pairs of eyes staring at me. Yeah, it's true. She ran away with this guy Jay from our hometown. I answered, That was enough for Kyle. All right, guys, seriously. He's the sheriff's kid. What do you think's gonna happen if he gets caught with weed? Well, the man's right, Phil. Let's bounce. I don't need any more trouble with the cops around here, Patrick said. Later, Walker. Kimber, little man. Phil stood up, brushed off his pants, and jumped from the boulder onto the sandy beach below. He sprayed sand all over a couple of freshman girls who squealed and called him an asshole. Phil tipped an invisible hat to them. Ladies, he said before walking off. Patrick followed him off the rock, and as I watched them make their way down to the beach, I became aware of the conversation going on behind me. I didn't say I wanted to go. I said I had to go, Kimber said. But it's only two o'clock, and it's Sunday. I know, but my parents been fighting a lot lately, and I didn't want to leave my mom alone too long. I thought she was doing better. A little, but she's still depressed, Kyle. You want to stay over at my place tonight? Kimber's voice dropped into a whisper. I just don't. I don't think I'm ready for that yet, Kyle. No, wait. That's not what I meant. I'd sleep on the pullout in the basement, and you would have my room. Very awkward silence. My parents love you, you know, he added. Kimber laughed. I know. I just want to be there for my mom right now. But thank you, sweetie. And then the absolutely disgusting sound of my best friend's kissing. I'd never get used to it. Ugh. On that note, I'm out of here, too. I stood up and gave them both a shaming look. Oh, come on, Sam, don't be jealous. We'll find you a girlfriend someday. Kyle joked. I really don't need your help with that, I muttered, glancing down to the beach where Emmeline Adler was sunbathing. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Last week of school, 
Kimber yelled at my retreating back. Thank God. Tomorrow was the last Monday of the school year, and while I should have been thankful my sophomore year was ending, I wasn't. The summer meant no distractions, more time to think, and even more hours of boredom at Prescott Artisan Sandwiches. But I wasn't looking forward to tomorrow for another reason. Besides it being Monday, it was also sophomore ditch day. My dad had caught on to that several weeks ago and warned me to set a good example and go to school that day. Sometimes I really hated being the son of the county sheriff. Kimber and Cal were sympathetic and had offered a share in my misery. I had, of course, said yes, much to Cal's sadness. As I expected, my dad was waiting for me when I got home. We shared a brief, strained conversation about our respective days, and then he finally got to it. Remember, Sammy, we're cracking down on truancy this year. I want to see you at school tomorrow. Yeah, I got it, Dad. And I hope I won't see Kyle's name cross my desk either. I sighed. It's just a tradition. Even the teachers sort of encourage it. On Friday, they said, I don't care what they said, Sam. Besides the fact that I'm the sheriff, I'm also your father and I want my son in school. I laughed and shook my head. What a joke. I can't control what Kyle does. Fair enough, but you can control what you do. I said nothing and Dad sighed. It's almost over, Sam. Just get through these last five days and you can be done with school for a few years if that's what you want. Fine. I walked out of the kitchen, effectively ending the conversation. I climbed the stairs and passed by Whitney's door on the way to my room. The light was on and silence was behind it. I knew my mother was in there. She was always in there. And God knows what. I walked to my own room, shut the door behind me, and locked it. The next day at school ended up being more embarrassing than anything else. There were a few other people that hadn't skipped, maybe a total of eight of us, and the looks they shot at me made it clear that my dad was the reason they were there. Kimber, great friend that she was, happily went to her classes like it was a normal day. Kyle attended all of my classes with me. The teachers, who'd been looking forward to an easy day, couldn't have cared less. Just before lunch, an officer came around to all the classrooms and asked for copies of the attendance sheets. Dad really wasn't kidding about cracking down this year. I was going to get shit from people all summer. At lunch, Kyle and I went out to my car to smoke. Usually, we were hidden by dozens of large pickup trucks, but today we were out in the open and vulnerable. I moved my car back to a shady corner of the parking lot, and Kyle pulled out his bowl. Did you text Kimber? I asked him while he hit it. Yep, he said through tight lips as he let the smoke sit in his lungs and then blew it out all over my dashboard. She went home around fourth period. She said her mom called her and she was going home to take care of her. I don't know, man. Doesn't your mom hate you? I asked, taking my turn with a bowl. Yeah. I mean, that's a fairly new development, ever since Kimber and I started dating. But I'm pretty sure she's always hated me and just hit it better before. Now that she's all depressed and whatever, she doesn't give a shit. It was hard to picture anyone hating Kyle. Why can't Kimber's dad take care of her? I don't know. I hit the pipe again. Hey, man, let's not even go back today, Kyle said. You think? I asked. Yeah, I mean, you put in four periods. You've been a good son. And Officer Dickass already came around and collected the attendance sheets. Dickass? Really? You're better than that, man. Officer ass. Dick? You're fucking bait, Kyle. Seriously, man, let's go. I thought about it for a second. Kyle was right. I'd done my duty as a son, 
And if I left now, I'd have enough time to go to GameStop before work. Fuck it. I turned the key in the ignition. Kyle sat up in his chair and rolled down the window to clear out the smoke. Hey, man, can you drop me by, Kimbers? Sure, but how are you going to get home? Can you come get me after work? What if her mom throws you out again? Kyle rolled his eyes. That was one time. Why can't I just drop you at home? You can take your own car. It needs new tires. New tires, of course. What really Kyle meant was that his insurance had lapsed and he didn't have any money for gas. He bought the car last summer after working double shifts at the convenience store for half a year. It was an okay car, newer, but I knew he only wanted it to impress Kimber, something he vehemently denied. Had it worked? I don't really think so. They started dating in the fall, and Kyle had quit his job to spend more time with her. Kimber didn't seem like the kind of girl to be impressed by a Pontiac Bonneville, but Kyle was convinced that was how he would won her over. I was sure all the car had really done was give him the confidence to ask her out. And now that it's part of their romance that's ended, the car is set in a garage with the Landry home, collecting dust instead of memories. GameStop didn't have what I wanted, and neither did Prescott Games and media. Since I had nothing else to do, I decided to show up to work early and hope that Mira would cut me loose early, too. I parked in front and walked in the door, unsurprised to see no one at the front counter. Only three people worked at the shop, and sadly, I never got to see the other girl, Emmeline, who worked on the days I didn't. This was especially disappointing to me, since she was half the reason I applied there in the first place. I went into the back to tell Mira I was there, and found her slumped over her desk on a pile of receipts and paperwork. This wasn't an unusual way to find Mira, but something seemed different today. I immediately felt a disturbance in the forest, but before I could quietly retreat, she turned toward me and I saw what I had only sensed before. Mira was crying. Are you, um, uh, are you? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she said quickly, wiping her eyes. Is it four already? No, it's 2.15. I thought maybe if I came in early. Oh, right, it's your ditch day. Mira wiped her eyes only to have them fill with tears again. I don't understand, Sam. This store, this store has been operating in the red ever since I was hired to manage it. What am I doing wrong? I don't know, I offered lamely, the instinct to escape never stronger. No one comes in here, ever. And Mr. Prescott refuses to let me put signs up to advertise. He says they're unsightly. But how does he expect me to pull in business? I need this job, Sam. God, I just... I must have looked like a frightened deer because when Mira finally looked up at me, she seemed to suddenly collect herself. Go ahead and go out to the front. I'll, I'll do your time card. She didn't have to tell me twice. I really liked Mira and I hated seeing her like this. The front didn't end up being much better. I could hear Mira crying over the store's dated music track. Her sobs went from painfully audible to muffled whimpers. After half an hour, I decided I had to do something. Since I was entirely unequipped to deal with an adult woman's emotional breakdown, I decided to call Mira's husband, Owen. He was thankfully at home and answered on the second ring. I'll be right there. I breathed a sigh of relief when I heard a truck pull up outside and saw the tall yet girthy Owen step out of it. He walked in during a quiet lull in his wife's sobs. I'm sorry to call you at home, Mr. Daly. I just didn't know what else to do. That's okay, Sam. He did the right thing. He looked tired, as if this situation wasn't new to him. Is she okay? I asked. Oh, yeah, he nodded. We're just going through some things. 
Oh, yeah. Mara said the store is going bankrupt. I winced as soon as the words were out of my mouth. Yeah, Owen ran a hand through his hair. That's part of it, although I don't think Jim is going to let that happen. Mira is more upset about... He sighed. Has Mira told you about her... Uh, appointments? Uh, no. Well, the thing is, we've been trying to have a baby for years. Very long, painful years. It's just so goddamn important for her to have a baby. And, you know, she blames me for our fertility issues. He walked around the room, glancing at the pictures on the wall and not really talking to me anymore. I understand why it's important to her. I just don't understand the obsession with it, you know? Because she's the last one in her family? Because she's the last McCaskey on the planet? I mean, does she even realize that our baby wouldn't be a McCaskey? He'd be a daily. I tell you, Sam, never marry a woman with a crazy father and four dead uncles. They develop these obsessions with lineage and four dead uncles? What? Oh, yeah, the famous ones. You know the four brothers who died in the Drisking Mines? Well, that only left her dad. And her parents were only able to conceive her, which leaves her as the last McCaskey and hope for the family line. So, of course, you see how this is all my fault. I looked at him blankly, and he sighed. I'm sorry, kid. These aren't your problems, and they're way over your pay grade anyway. I'm just very stressed out right now. Our medical issues and Mira's absolute abhorrence to our only other option. I just... But how did they die? I was desperate to talk about anything else, and the story of Mira's uncles interested me. The McCaskey boys? I don't really know. They died on the mountain somewhere. Oh, well, uh, have you heard of the skinned men? The skinned men? Yeah. I don't think so. What about Baraska? Owen Daly squeezed his eyes shut and pushed in on his temples with his fingers. What? What does a Baraska have to do with anything? Owen? Mira's voice squeaked from the doorway. Oh, baby, are you okay? Sam called the house. I want to do it. You do? Owen asked dubiously. I called him. His eyes flickered over to me, and I immediately looked away. Another conversation I didn't want to part in. Sam, why don't you take off for the day? Mira and I will handle things here. Okay. I mumbled and bolted for the door. Once I was in my car and backing away, I called Kyle. Dude, fucking weird shit's going on in this town. What happened? Uh, I can't explain it over the phone. Where you at? I'm at Kimber's. Are you off work? Yeah. Can you come get me? By at Kimber's, Kyle meant sitting on the curb in front of the house, kicked off the property again. When I pulled up, Kimber came out and met us at the curb. I'm so sorry, Kyle, she said. She's really upset today. She wouldn't even let me leave the house to sit with you. It's okay, he said. Don't worry about me. I just want to make sure you and your mom are okay. We're okay, and my dad will be home soon. Text us when he gets home, and we'll come get you, I said. I wish I could. I'm babysitting tonight until 7.30. Maybe after that? Sure. Kyle and Kimber hugged goodbye, and then Kimber rushed back to her house as something crashed inside. So what's going on? Kyle asked, taking a sip of warm Dr. Pepper, sitting in my cup holder. You're still wearing your apron, you know. Uh, Mira had a breakdown, I said, feeling it off. Really? What happened? I told Kyle the full story, paying particular attention to the four uncles. Yeah, the McCloskeys. I've heard of them. Didn't know Mira was one, though. I thought they were all dead. 
Yeah, she's the last one. So, like, do you think the McCaskies' deaths have anything to do with the other disappearances? It had been a while since I'd mentioned anything about Baraska. Kyle choked a little on the warm soda. I don't... I don't know, man. I mean, maybe if the disappearance had started around the same time? How can we find that out? Maybe the cops? There have to be police reports. Okay. But what if I couldn't ask my dad? Kyle shook his head. I don't know, then. What about, like, records? The historical society people, maybe. Oh, yeah, he said, nodding. We can try them. They're over on second. They share an office with Drisking Arts and Antiques. I made a U-turn and started back toward town. Hey, uh, Sammy, why are we doing this? I'd known the question was coming, but I'd hoped to have more answers myself before giving him one. It's just... Whitney, was all I could say. Kyle didn't ask anything more. The History Preservation Society of Drisking was at the back of the antique shop, and the owner, a wan, stone-faced Mr. Dranger, eyed us warily as we walked through. At the end of a short hallway, we found a small room with two desks pushed together. One was empty, and the other was stacked high with books and folders of loose paper. We could hear someone typing behind the stacks. I cleared my throat. Hello? A small woman popped up from behind the desk. I recognized her as the same woman who had given us the lecture in sixth grade. Hello. How can I help you, boys? She asked, walking out to greet us. Uh, yeah. I have a few questions about Drisking's history, I, I guess. Oh, great. Is this for a end-of-year report? Have a seat, boys. She gestured to the empty chair sitting behind the other desk. I nodded at Kyle, and he sat down, looking uneasy. Yeah, it's for an essay we have to write. Hey, I think you gave a lecture to us, like five years ago, with Jimmy Prescott. Oh, yes, I give that lecture every year with Mr. Prescott. She smiled. Yeah, it was you and one other guy, too, a bald guy. Kyle said, shifting uncomfortably in the wooden chair. Yes, that was my fiancé, Wyatt Dowding. He passed several years ago. Oh, Kyle said. So, uh, Miss, Miss, Miss Scanlon, but you can call me Catherine, she said. Catherine, I tried. I hated calling adults by their first name. Um, we want to know about the McCaskey kids. Ooh, Catherine said, shaking her head. A dark part of history there, but history nonetheless. Yeah, so when did it happen? And how'd they die? Kyle added. Well, they didn't die. I mean, they certainly perished in the mines. But their bodies were never recovered, so we don't know the answer to that. I would think dehydration, starvation and exhaustion killed them within days of getting lost down there. And to your second question, that was 1953, I believe. And the mines closed that year? Well, actually, the mines officially closed the year after. There was a legal spat between the city and the Prescott family, who wanted to leave the mines open until the bodies were recovered. But the city won, and the mines were condemned. Wait. Why did the Prescotts care? Don't you want to write this down? Catherine asked. Kyle tapped his temple twice with his finger. Catherine shrugged and continued. Well, the Prescott and the McCaskey families were closely related. Tom Prescott was paying teams of unemployed miners to go down in the mines and search for the bodies. The city had had enough of it, the mountain was unstable, and they didn't want any more deaths. The mines had been abandoned years before and were structurally unsafe. After the city banned the recovery teams from the mines, members of the Prescott family started going down there themselves. One of them, a cousin, I think, 
died during the search from a fall down a shaft, and the city had finally had enough. Less than a week later, they hastily had the mines collapsed. With bombs? Kyle asked. Well, with explosives. And that's what led to the incident, as it's called. By this time, the mines had been unprofitable for a few years, and the city was quite broke. They hired a less-than-reputable company to collapse the mines, and, well, when they set off the explosives, they accidentally broke into Drisking's water table. The city went into debt trying to purify the water of silt and iron ore. It wasn't until two years later that things started getting better thanks to the Prescotts, who truly did revitalize Drisking. Kyle's phone chirped, and he pulled it out of his pocket. It's Kimber. She wants us to come over. Okay. Thanks, Miss Scanlon. I mean, Catherine. Sure. If you have any other questions, feel free to come by. We're almost always open during the day. Oh, or you can email me. She dug into her jacket pocket and pulled out a loose business card. It was creased and had a dusty smudge on it. Thanks. So what do you think? Kyle asked when we got to the car. I don't know. It's weird, isn't it? I mean, why would the Prescotts give a shit if the town suffers after they refuse to help them find their family and were actively working against them? Maybe they forgave and forgot. Kyle shrugged. Does Jimmy Prescott seem like a guy to forgive and forget to you? Uh, no. His dad's even worse. Exactly. Maybe we should... Turn here. Sorry. Kimber's still babysitting, and she's over on Amherst. When we pulled up, Kimber was out in the driveway with two young boys who were playing in the front yard. She was holding a sleeping baby and waving to us. We parked in the driveway, and she introduced us to the two older kids. They gave us shy hellos, then ran off to continue their game. Once they'd left, we explained everything that had happened that afternoon to Kimber, while she listened and rocked the baby in her arms. Well, Sam's right. That doesn't make sense. But why are we even concerned about something that happened decades ago? Whitney, Kyle said, so I didn't have to. Flash of surprise crossed Kimber's face and she walked over to put the baby down in his playpen. Then she walked back and pulled me into one of her famous super comforting, not at all awkward Kimber hugs. When she released me, she began to pace around the driveway. Okay, so we think Whitney somehow got involved in all of this, and if you're right, if we want to figure this out, we need to start at the beginning. Phil's right. Every mystery in this town is one piece of a larger puzzle. It's all related. She stopped and looked over at us. I think we need to go to the source if we want answers. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Kyle agreed. I know he likes to hang out in the hideway and get drunk with ex-Sheriff Clary. Uh, no, Kyle. Not Jimmy. His dad. Tom? No way. He's so crazy they put him in a home. He's the horse's mouth, though, isn't he? Jimmy isn't likely to know half as much as his dad. But, as Kyle and Kimber argued, I watched the kids chase each other around the tree in the front yard. There seemed to be something carved in the bark. Words, not unlike the triple tree at Ambercott Fort. I was too far away to read what it said. He got you. He got you. I heard the youngest one call to his brother. The skin man got you. Now you have to die. Nuh-uh, Peter. I was touching the tree. No, you weren't. You're a liar. One of them got you, and now you have to meet the shiny gentleman. No, I don't. Kimber, Josh is cheating. I shuddered and turned away from them. Where's the nut house? I interrupted them. Is it close? It's not a nut house. It's more like a hospice. Kimber chided. 
The rumor I've heard is that he's at Golden Elm, and that's in Cape Girardeau. It's about 40 minutes away, Kyle said, and pulled out his phone. I'll check the visiting hours for Tuesday. Sam, do you work tomorrow? I work every day, but I'll get out of it. I promised. Okay, cool. Let's plan to leave after school. The following day dragged on like any last Tuesday of the school year. Most people talked about what they did with their ditch day or complained about a cop showing up at their house to issue them a ticket while sliding less than please looks my way. When the final bell rang at 3.30, I grabbed my bag and booked it out to my car. Kyle and Kimber were already waiting for me. The drive took longer than expected when I got lost in Cape Girardeau. The town was bigger than Drisking, and the streets weren't laid out with any sort of planning or logic that I could see. By the time we arrived at Golden Elm, there were only twenty minutes left for visiting hours. We're here to see Mr. Thomas Prescott, Kimber told the nurse at the front desk. We tended to let her do the talking, since she had a disarming, old-fashioned charm about her that usually put people in an agreeable mood. Old oh, Tom. Wow, he hasn't had a visitor since his son came in around Christmas. Your family, then. You know where his room is? The nurse arched a thin, suspicious eyebrow. I'm sorry, we don't, Kimber apologized. My mother has been asking me to check in on my great uncle while she's away doing doctors without borders. I should have gotten more information from her, but, you know, she only has so many minutes to call home. Oh, of course, dear. Go ahead and sign in. I'll get someone to escort you. An orderly led us to Tom Prescott's room, which we found empty. He pointed down the long corridor and said, He likes to read in the sunroom. We walked down the hall and found an old, thin man, all alone and whispering to himself. He was sitting at a table, sliding chess pieces over a backgammon board. Tom Prescott? Kimber asked, smiling. He didn't look up, and I wondered if he heard her at all. Kimber took a deep breath to try again, but the old man suddenly slammed his fist on the table. I'm him, goddammit! I'm Mr. Thomas Prescott. Don't call me Tom. People's kids used to have more respect, you know. I'm sorry, sir, Kimber said gently as she sat down in the chair opposite him. You kids have no respect. Do you even know who I am? It's my son's fault. That boy's mama should have whipped him, but she was soft and now he's running around my town spreading his vulgarity and disrespect. He spat the last word out as if it were a salmon bone. Our apologies, Mr. Prescott. We never meant to be disrespectful. We greatly admire you. We're from Drisking. You're the man who built our town. Everyone remembers that. Everyone was suffering and the town was dying, and then you fixed it. We know that. I did what I had to do. The old man grunted. It was my town. It still is. Who are you, little girl, to come in here and suggest otherwise? Ah, no, no, that's not what I said. Kimber changed tactics. And as for who we are, we're Mirror McCaskey's kids. Do you remember the McCaskies? Huh. So you're Ada's granddaughter. And that explains why you're not there. Kyle and I exchanged puzzled looks. We're right here, Mr. Prescott, Kimber said. You know what I meant, young lady. They all know. They know I rescued the town. That's my town. Of course, they were going to let me do anything I wanted as long as the money kept coming in. That's why it's my town. Is the money still coming in? Kimber tested. Well, you're here, aren't you? They didn't like it, but they took the money. They didn't know. Not everything they didn't, but they suspected some. And they kept electing Cleary, and they kept taking the money. Prescott picked up a pawn and ran his fingers over it as he talked. It's just a powder, you know, so unassuming. A fine, soft powder. The 
powder doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know how it's bad. It's the people who say it's bad. But it needed to be done. You know that. Ada, you know we had to do it. Kimber hooked him in. I know. I know we had to do it, but it's your son. I don't think he's doing it right anymore. Well, of course he isn't. The elderly Prescott slammed his fist in the table again, and two rooks tumbled to the floor. They were mine. He took them from me. He thought he could do it better, but he took mine and he ruined my legacy. Decades of work, and now it's all run by the powder, the dust of my crumbled empire. What about the skin men? I asked, caught up in the moment. What are you talking about, boy? He growled. In the tree house. The triple tree. What is it? What is it for? Triple tree? Is that what he's offering again? We paid triple the price, but it was only for a short while, when things were slow. We certainly never charged triple. That's just bad business. Where is Bor... He's my idiot son, boy. Been telling you that. Did he offer you triple for them? He's ruining my town, isn't he? God damn it, Jimmy. You get him in here. Ada, get my boy on the phone. You tell Jimmy I want to talk to him. You tell him they're still mine. Ada? Ada, get Jimmy on the phone. Kimber jumped up and Kyle pushed her behind him as the old man rose to his feet. Tall and surprisingly imposing for his fragility, we were already backing toward the door when the orderly came in with a disapproving look on his face and shooed us out. Long after we'd made it to the lobby, we could still hear Tom Prescott yelling for his son. The ride home was quiet, and I spent it trying to fit the pieces of the puzzle together. The skinned man, the triple tree... The shiny gentleman, the powder. These things seem to have been pulled blindly from the ether, random and meaningless. And the veil over my eyes was thick and heavy, for I was closer to Baraska than I'd ever been before. I could feel it all around me. I just couldn't see it. I snapped out of my thought when I realized Cal was pulling over off the road. He put the car in park and turned around to look at me in the back seat. Is this really about Whitney, Sam? Yes. Kimber watched us with worried eyes. Why? The cops, I mean. Even your father confirmed that Whitney ran away. I don't believe them, I said through clenched teeth. Look, Sam, we're getting pretty deep in here, and I'm with you every step, but... I have to know that there's a reason we're doing this. And pulling Kimber in, too? I have to know this is important for you for the right reason, and not just an obsession. I looked out the window and realized he'd pulled over near the West Rim Prescott Orr trailhead. It was right to worry, and even more so, to be protective of Kimber. Kyle was thinking it, and so was I. It was all about the powder. If Baraska really did involve moving drugs, did I want to involve my friends any further? That wasn't their fight. I love these people. Could I really risk their safety for my own curiosity and vendettas? But as hard as I wished, I could let them go. I knew I needed them. I needed them in this with me. I have to know what really happened to Whitney. I said quietly, Kyle turned back around without a word, and Kimber placed her hand on mine. I jerked it away and crossed my arms, but immediately apologized. Kimber just smiled in her forgiving sort of way. Kyle sighed. Sam. He was interrupted by the piercing ring of Kimber's phone. She scrambled for his cell phone to silence it, but when she saw the name on the screen, she quickly answered. Dad? What? Wait, what? What do you mean? Dad, hello? No, wait, slow down. Hello? She took the phone away from her ear. Something happened to my mom and she's at the hospital. She said in a sort of shock. Kyle threw the car in gear and screeched out of the parking lot. We made the ten-mile trip to the hospital in as many minutes 
which was criminally fast on surface streets. Kyle slammed on the brakes at the emergency entrance, and Kimber and I ran inside. A deputy was already waiting there. He refused to answer Kimber's desperate questions as he led us down the hall to her father. When the deputy swung the doors open, I saw my dad standing next to Kimber's, and I immediately braced myself for the worst. Kimber's dad took her in one direction, and my dad and I went in another. Before he said a word to me, I saw Kimber crumble to the floor on the other side of the room. I looked at my dad for confirmation, and he gave me a sympathetic nod and pulled me into a hug. We sat down in a corner, and I stared at my hands as he quietly explained that Mrs. DeStaro had gone grocery shopping around one o'clock, come home, put the groceries away, made two lasagnas and a meatloaf, and put them in the freezer. Then she got into her car, drove to the hospital, parked in the shade, took the stairs up seven floors to the roof, and jumped off of it. She lived long enough to apologize to the EMT who found her. I watched Kimber wail from across the room as her mother's body grew cold in the morgue beneath us. Part 3 Do you think she blames herself? I don't know, man, probably. I stretched out on a reclined seat of my Chevy and pulled the bill of my hat lower over my eyes. But do you think she's okay? I didn't answer him. I certainly hadn't been okay when Whitney died and Kimber was even closer to her mom than I was to my sister. She was definitely not okay. Sam, seriously, I'm fucking freaking out here. It's been two days. I pushed my hat up off my face and looked over at Kyle, who was admittedly a wreck. His eyes were bloodshot, his face sallow, and his red hair was slick with grease. Dude, her mom committed suicide. You know how close Kimber was to her mom? She just needs some time, but she'll be okay. She hasn't answered any of my texts or calls. I left her like nine voicemails, man. I think I'm going crazy. You just have to give her space. Yeah, but she's my... my. He still couldn't say it around me. I'm supposed to be looking after her. I sat up and pulled the chair upright behind me. Look, Kyle, I, I know you want to help Kimber. I want to help Kimber, too. But she hasn't answered our calls, been to school, or come to the door when we've gone to her house. She doesn't want to see us. Right now, Kimber knows what's best for Kimber. What about the suicide note? You think that has something to do with it? I sighed. We don't even know if there was a note. Kimber's dad was pretty messed up when he said that, and I probably misheard him anyway. I asked my dad, and he said there was no letter. Right, because your dad is such a beacon of truth. One look at Kyle told me he immediately regretted his words. I shrugged. I don't know what to believe anymore. The truth was that I was sure of what I'd heard. Mr. DeStaro had said something to the cops about a letter, but I couldn't tell Kyle that, not right now. He was already worried that his relationship with Kimber was part of the reason her mom had been so depressed. I asked my dad about the letter when he'd come home after a long night, and he sighed, run both of his hands through his hair in a tired sort of way, and said, Sam, I don't know what to tell you. And the star who didn't leave a suicide note, and this is the first I've heard of it. With our best friend in mourning and our investigation on hold, Kyle and I had been existing in a sort of suspended state we went to school intermittently, skipping classes here and there, missing end-of-year tests and smoking more weed than either of us could afford. Without Kimber there to set us straight and keep us in line, we were lethargic, brooding, and irresponsible. I'd never realized how much I relied on her. 
Kyle and I skipped the last two periods of the day and debated on whether we should even go to school the following day, which was the last day of our senior year and graduation. We finally decided to show up for second period, which was fortunate, because Kimber showed up in biology. I didn't even see her at first. I had my head down on my desk, resting on my folded arms when I felt a meek hand pat on my shoulder. I turned around to see her standing there, looking unsure and uncomfortable. I gave her a half-smile and pulled her into a hug. But it wasn't a super-comforting, not-at-all-awkward Kimber hug. It was a longer, weaker hug, and I felt so protective in it that I was sad when it was over. How you doing, Kay? I asked her. Kimber wiped a tear off her cheek. I'm okay. She gave me a wobbly smile, and I knew it wasn't true. I wrapped her into another quick hug as Phoebe Dranger gave us a snotty look. Have you seen Kyle yet? No, I have next period with him. He's been worried about you. I know, she said, sliding her eyes to the floor. Things have been really hard for me at home. It's okay, I said. We're here for whatever you need. Yeah, that's... That's what I was hoping. Whatever you need. Since it was the last day of school, our teacher, Mr. Founder, was just happy to return our graded tests and let us bullshit for the rest of the period. Kimber talked about the arrangements for the funeral that weekend and chided me for skipping finals to get stoned. When the bell finally rang, I could tell that Kimber was both excited and nervous to see Kyle. As we packed up our bags, I assured her that Kyle wasn't mad. He was just really, really worried about her. She threw her bag over her shoulder, set her jaw, and nodded. Kimber was trying so hard to keep it together. As soon as Kyle saw her from down the hall, he slammed his locker shut and walked toward us with such intensity that I began to wonder if maybe he was mad. He pushed past a dozen people without so much as glancing at them and left a curious, if annoyed, crowd in his wake. When he finally reached us, Kyle threw his backpack against the wall and swooped Kimber up in a sort of way you'd see in old black-and-white movies. Everyone who watched all this unfold, including me, groaned in unison. Since most of the teachers weren't even bothering to take attendance that day, I went to calculus with Kimber and Kyle, where they had the same conversation that Kimber and I had last period. Towards the end of the hour, the conversation faltered and became uneasy. Kyle and I exchanged a look over the top of Kimber's head, and I nodded at him. Kimber, he said quietly, did your mom leave a letter? What? Kimber asked in surprise. I heard your dad talking about a letter on the day that... on, uh, on Tuesday. I said, Oh. As we waited for her to continue, the bell rang for lunch. Everyone filed out of the room but the three of us, who stayed sitting on our desks. Kimber, I finally said. She sighed sadly and looked over at Kyle. Yes. It was a letter. What did it say? He asked nervously. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I asked my dad for it when we got home, and he said I'd misheard him and there was no letter. He said not to mention it to anyone else, or I'd just upset people. Well, then we both misheard him, I said, which seems unlikely. I've known my dad all my life. I know when he's lying. People started to filter in for the next period, sliding sympathetic glances at Kimber. Since it was our lunch hour, we gathered up our things and walked out to my car, as we always did. I sat in the back seat, letting Kyle and Kimber take up front. Kimber took a deep breath and continued, I know my dad's lying, and I know he has the letter. Are you sure? Kyle asked. I could tell he was still terrified that some of the blame rested on him. Yeah, and all I know is it contains the name 
Prescott. Prescott? Yet somehow I wasn't surprised. He was the access around which everything bad that happened spun. How do you know it says Prescott? Cal said. I heard my dad reading it once. I think he reads it a lot, actually. He was sort of sobbing and whispering the words and throwing things in his bedroom. My dad, he, he hasn't been well. Do you think she was having an affair with Jimmy Prescott? I shook my head. I'm guessing you need to think bigger than that, Kyle. I agree. Kimber said to her lap, With everything we know about the Prescotts, I'm fairly sure this isn't about an affair. It's all connected somehow, don't you think? My dad was the love of my mom's life, but she only left a letter for me. I think that somehow I'm the one she wronged, not him, you know? I think she did something to me. Or maybe she did it because of me. Kimber's voice broke over the last sentence, and Cal pulled her over, kissed the top of her head, and whispered words to her that I couldn't hear. So we need to get the letter, I said after giving them a minute. Yes, I really need to read it. Kimber's voice was still wobbly. How do we get it? I asked. If it's in his bedroom, we just need to wait until her dad isn't home, Kyle said as he looked out the window. You don't think I thought of that? Kimber sighed. Never leaves his room. Not since we got home from the hospital. He sleeps in there. So we need to get him out. No, we need to get me in. Tomorrow's my mom's funeral, and half of Drisking will be there, including my dad, of course. I need to leave without him noticing and run home so I can get through to the office. Okay, that's easy, I said. Without my dad noticing. And I need to be back by the end of the service. We both nodded but stayed silent because it looked like Kimber was weighing, saying more. My dad, he's been very cold and I think, I think he blames me. Kimber finally said, That's bullshit. Kyle spat. Can you guys help me? Absolutely. Of course. We spent the rest of the lunch hour creating a plan far more strategic than the mission probably called for. Kyle and I would engage Mr. DeStaro in conversation, and then Kyle would get a text from Kimber telling him she was having a breakdown in the bathroom. Kyle would leave to go comfort her, and they would take my car to the DeStaro house. I would stay behind and keep an eye on Kimber's dad while they were gone. We all decided that in light of everything that was going on, we would skip graduation that evening. I went to work in the afternoon for the first time since Monday. Mira seemed to be in a much better mood and let me go home early for the graduation ceremony that I wouldn't be attending. I went straight to bed, skipping all my parents' concerns about the milestone I was missing out on by deciding not to walk that evening. I didn't sleep well. Just before 4 a.m., I got up to go through my clothes, looking for something dressy and black to wear to the funeral. My dad came in before he left for work and found his disheveled, panicked son looking helplessly through piles of black and gray clothing. He smiled sadly and led me to his own closet. Since my dad and I had not only the same face, but the same bills as well, Finding something suitable to wear was easy. I thanked him, and he asked me to apologize to Kimber for having to work through the service and that he sends his love. And DeStaro's funeral was at an Episcopalian church on the other side of town. I picked Kyle up at nine and saw he was also wearing a suit of his dad's, though it didn't fit nearly as well, and he was constantly pulling at the sleeves and readjusting the waistline. Unfortunately for Kyle, he was much taller than his dad. We parked as far away from the church as possible in a spot no one would notice a car leaving from. When we went inside the church, 
We saw that Kimber wouldn't have to do much acting to convince people she was having a breakdown. She was at the back of the room, tucked into a chair, just a puddle of curly red hair and tears. Gal sat down next to her and pulled her into a hug. Jesus, Kimber, what's wrong? I kicked his foot and shot him a look that said, Really? Gal bit his lip. I mean, uh, uh, fuck. There's no one here. Kimber whispered against his chest. My mom grew up here. She had hundreds of friends in this town. No one came. We looked around, and I had to admit the turnout was sparse. A few groups of three or four people standing together. Kimber's dad, who sat in a chair opposite the room of his daughter, and some family I recognized from barbecues at Kimber's house. Ex-sheriff Clary and his wife Grace were there, standing with a few of my dad's deputies and talking quietly in the corner. I could see why Kimber was upset. As we waited for the service to start, I realized with a profound sadness that I'd never been to a funeral before. I wished that we'd had one for my sister, but I knew we never could since Whitney was still legally alive. It made my heart break to think that she would never be laid to rest. Only a few other funeral goers trickled in, and the pastor began getting people seated for the service. I noticed the casket at the pulpit for the first time, and was glad it was closed. Still, I had to wonder at the simple, unadorned, almost ugly coffin that had been chosen for Kimber's mom. I knew the Destaros had money, quite a lot of it, actually. It was an interesting, almost insulting choice. My heart went out to Kimber. As somber music began to fill the room, Kyle and I stood Kimber up and started over to the pews. Halfway there, she stopped. I'm ready, she said and brushed her hair away from her wet face. Ready for... to leave. I can't be here anymore. It's a disgrace to my mother. Kimber raised her head a notch and squared her jaw. I knew this look. There would be no reasoning with her. Kyle and I looked warily at each other. It would be a lot more obvious that Kimber was missing from the service with the low turnout. You guys go over and say what we rehearsed to my dad. Kyle, I'll text you in 30 seconds. Go. Kyle nodded and started over, and I knew we weren't arguing. Mr. DeStaro was finally standing, looking over at the front pew reserved for him, and his daughter with an almost nervous hesitation. Uh, Mr. DeStaro? I said as we approached. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about your wife. She was, shit, I'd forgotten my lines. A great woman who raised a wonderful daughter. Kyle finished. Yeah spat. Do great women commit suicide, leaving their wonderful daughters behind? Uh, shit. Do great women jump off buildings and make spectacles of themselves? Do they leave their families to deal with the publicity and the grief they caused? Kyle's phone chirped. Thank God. Oh, that's Kimber. Kyle said a little too fast before he had time to actually look at his phone. Oh, man. She isn't well. Says she's crying and feeling sick. I'm going to go sit with her. No, Mr. DeStaro yelled so suddenly that Kyle dropped his phone on the ground, sounding a loud clatter on the stone flooring. Not you. You don't help my daughter. You don't even talk to her. He can go. He pointed at me. Uh, okay, I stuttered. The plan had changed too much. I need to, to somehow get the car keys from Kyle without being seen. Kyle gave me a shaky, subtle nod, and then he and Mr. DeStaro went to sit down. It was obvious Kimber's dad was keeping an eye on Kyle, but when he pulled him into the pew at the front of the church, getting the car keys from Kyle was going to be nearly impossible. I backed into the shadows at the back of the room while the pastor started the service, 
I texted Cal four times asking for help, but he wouldn't dare touch his phone. He just stared straight ahead, flicking word glances at Mr. DeStaro every few seconds. After several minutes, I went to find Kimber to see what she wanted to do, but she wasn't in our meeting place by the back door. The plan was falling apart. I pulled up my phone and sent her a text. Me, where are you? Me, Kyle's next to your dad and I can't get the keys from him. I waited in the hallway, tapping my phone against my hand nervously. After a minute or two, my phone vibrated. Kimber, Kyle slipped me the keys. I'm sorry. I left without you guys. I had to get out of there. I'm so sorry. I'll be back before the end of the service, I promise. Shit. Me. Be safe. It was now imperative that I not be seen. I went to the men's bathroom, locked myself in a stall, and played Brick Breaker for the longest twenty minutes of my life. I knew the service wouldn't go on much longer, so I texted Kimber again. Me. You on your way back yet? I didn't find you. I sat, waiting, watching the minutes tick by. I texted to her again. Me. I think the service is ending soon. Where are you? Another seven minutes. No response. I tried calling, but it went to voicemail. I tried again with the same result. I was getting nervous. I was about to try a third time when a text popped up from Kyle. The service was over. Kyle, why aren't you guys back yet? Did you find anything? I left the bathroom stall and found Kyle staring out the window looking for my car. Kyle? He jumped. Where's Kimber? What did you guys find? I don't know. She left without me. What the fuck? Why? Where is she? I don't know, Kyle. She left without me. I reiterated. She's not answering my calls or my texts. Fuck, mine either. We have to keep an eye on her dad until she gets back. We're not the only ones. Kyle said, gesturing across the room. What the fuck is going on? Three men were talking to Kimber's dad in a corner across the room. The tallest was Killian Clary, who was flanked by two of his former deputies. Grisking's retired sheriff had his hand on Mr. DeStaro's arm and was speaking to him in an angry, hushed tone. Kimber's dad was shaking his head and desperately objecting to something. The two deputies walked out the front door of the church, and Mr. DeStaro sagged against Killian Clary, who sat him in a nearby chair. Something was happening. Call Kimber now, Cal said. I tried again, and this time the call rang once and was sent to voicemail. I ended the call and threw up my hands, looking desperately at Kyle. Again, he said and took out his own phone. I got the same result, but felt relief wash over me when someone answered Kyle's call. My heart sank when I realized it wasn't Kimber. Phil, what part of town are you in? I need a ride. It's an emergency. Yeah, man, I'm at Northridge Church. As fast as you can. I'm with Sam. I'll owe you. Kyle hung up and then immediately tried Kimber's phone. She's sending me a voicemail, too. We both stood at the window, anxiously waiting to see Phil's silver Mazda pull up. Kyle chewed his lip, and I tapped my phone nervously against my leg. Come on, Saunders. We threw occasional looks back at Kimber's dad until Clary stood him up and ushered the now inconsolable man out of the church. Suddenly, Kyle's phone chirped, and we both looked down to see Kimber's name flash on the screen. Kyle's knees nearly buckled in relief, and he sagged against the wall. Kimber, I found it. Kyle opened the text and furiously typed a reply. Kyle, they're coming for you, Kay. We both stared at the phone, waiting for a response. And just as Phil's silver sedan pulled lazily into the parking lot, we got one. Kimber, they're here. It was the last message we got from Kimber. 
When Phil dropped us at the Destaro house, we found the front door unlocked and no one home. My car was sitting in the driveway, unlocked with the keys sitting on the front seat. Kyle and I drove back to the church, but the funeral was over, and the few people that had attended were already gone. We drove back to Kimber's house again, but it was just as we had left it, and still no one was home. Kyle had lost it by this time and was an absolute wreck. He'd called her so many times, I was sure he killed her battery. His calls went straight to voicemail, and his texts remained unanswered. After a half hour of undignified begging from Kyle, I finally called my dad. He answered immediately. Sammy, what's wrong? It's Kimber, Dad. She's gone. We've looked everywhere, but she and her dad are missing. She left the funeral early, and, and Killian Cleary was talking to her dad, and then Samson and Grig left, and I think they went to her house and they got her. I think they're still working for Clary on the side or something, and I think they took her somewhere. She... Whoa, 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 slow down. Come by the station, let's talk. I'll take a statement from you boys, and I'll send a couple officers over to investigate the house right now. Just calm down, Sam, we'll handle this. I hung up and threw my car violently into reverse, jerking the wheel to the left as I hit the end of the driveway. Sam, Sam, how do we know... How do we know we can trust the cops? Because we don't have a choice right now. And we're not trusting the cops. We're trusting my dad. I said, my words sounding hopeless even to me. I turned into the Butler County Sheriff's Office, and Kyle was out of the car as soon as I slowed down to park. By the time I got inside, my dad had Kyle by the shoulders and was nodding solemnly at everything Kyle was telling him. When my dad saw me... He motioned for an officer to take us to his office. After a few minutes, he came in and sat down across the desk from us. All right, boys, I'm going to have Officer Ramirez come in for a few minutes and take an official statement from you both. I want you to know that right now, it looks like the Destaros left town voluntarily. No, nah, no way, Mr. Walker. Kimber would never. My dad held up his hand for silence. Let me rephrase. Jacob DeStaro left town voluntarily. Kimber is a minor, and she has no legal rights here. If her dad decides that they're leaving, then they're leaving. But she's not answering her phone, and he went to that house, Dad. Nothing was packed. Maybe they're just getting away for a while. Maybe going to her relatives. I can't theorize as to why she wouldn't answer her phone, other than maybe she wants to be left alone for a while. Kyle was exasperated. But, look, I know it's hard for you to understand, but losing a family member takes a toll on a person. Sam, you know that. We don't know how people are going to grieve, and we don't have a right to. I think it's very likely that Kimber will be back by the fall. The fall? Sheriff Walker, that's three months away. You need to investigate now. Kyle, I know you're upset. No one said we're not going to investigate thoroughly. Like you investigated Whitney's disappearance thoroughly? I spat and I didn't regret the words. Sam. He snapped with more force than I'd ever heard him use. Tired of listening to you insinuate that I didn't do everything I could to find Whitney. I love your sister more than you can imagine. She's my daughter, Sammy, and I will never give her up. What about the deputies that left the funeral to go after Kimber? Kyle interrupted. My dad raised an eyebrow at me. Samson and Greg, I told you. I ground out through clenched teeth. He sighed. Boys, Samson and Greg left the funeral because I sent them out on a call. I stood up violently, knocking over my chair in the process. Oh, come on, Dad. All right, that's enough. The sheriff slammed his hand on the desk and stood up. I told you I would tell you what I know and I have. I understand your friend is important to you, and God damn it, I care about the Destaros too. I promise you that I'll use the full extent of my resources to track them down and put your minds at ease, but until then, all I can offer you is the assurance 
that there's no sign of fall play at this time. You boys need to get off the warpath and let us handle this. Now Ramirez is waiting in the hall to take your statements, and then both of you are going home. Understood? I said nothing and glared at my dad, seething with rage. Kyle stood up and walked out of the room with no emotion whatsoever. He walked past Ramirez, and I followed him out to the car. We got in, and I waited for Kyle to say something. I heard a loud sniffle and looked over at him to see his face slick with tears. It was the first time I'd ever seen Kyle, but not the last, crying. He's lying, he whispered. I just shook my head. I didn't know what to believe. Kyle turned his face away from me. He's lying. Something bad has happened, and he's lying about it. Like what? I heard more sniffling as Kyle tried to collect himself. Dude, fucking talk to me. What do you think happened? Kimmer's gone like all the others. She's at the place where bad things happen. Baraska? I said, and I just couldn't believe it. I punched the steering wheel. How the fuck had this happened? Fuck, not Kimber. Please, not Kimber. Was all of this because of me? Had her mother killed herself because of something I'd done? Something we'd found out? Was it my fault Kimber was missing? If I thought for one minute that that was true, I knew I would crack into a million tiny pieces. No, not Kimber. No. Yes, Sam. Fucking think about it. Kyle yelled at me. It's the tree house. It's all the same. Baraska, the skinned man, the triple tree, your sister, the mountain. It's all the fucking same. It's the Prescott Empire, and now Kimber is being fucking, fucking consumed by it. Where do we go? I could feel the warm tears of my own desperation and hopelessness sliding down my cheeks. What? What do we do? What do we fucking do? Cal threw his hands up in frustration. We have to go to Ampercott, right? It all starts and ends at the triple tree, Sam. Surely you've figured that out. We've been to the treehouse a million times, Cal. There's nothing there. I don't know where the fuck else to go, Sam. Rap, rap, rap. I jumped as someone tapped on the window of the car and wiped the tears off my face. I rolled down the window as Officer Greg leaned down and looked in the car. You boys move along home, all right? Yep, I said, and turned the key in the ignition. Officer Greg waved at us as we pulled out of the parking lot, but we didn't wave back. The treehouse, Kyle said. We drove in silence, both of us, trying desperately to get a hold of ourselves. If we were going to be of any help to Kimber, we needed to be calm enough to think logically. I parked in the space next to the trailhead and saw several bikes tied to the post. As we made our way up the West Rim Prescott Ore Trail, we passed Parker coming down it with a couple of his friends. I nodded to him, but Kyle said nothing just stared up the trail, reaching for the only place he knew to go. It was almost dark by the time we reached Ambercott, and there was little light left to search for whatever Kyle had hoped to find. It took half an hour in the darkness before I finally convinced Kyle that there was nothing there to help Kimber. And the same dense, heavy black hole consumed my stomach as it had all those years ago when we were here searching for Whitney. This time had to be different. And though we didn't speak of it, I knew that he and I were both painfully aware of all the sounds of the night. We were scared, chilled down to our very bones, that we would hear the piercing, scraping, grinding metal screams of the monster at Baraska that we'd become so accustomed to over the years. I knew we both dreaded it, and prayed it would not come tonight. I dropped Kyle at home an hour later and promised that we would find Kimber tomorrow. I swore we would. 
He gave me nothing more than a shallow nod and disappeared inside his house. My dad was waiting for me in our kitchen when I walked in a few minutes later. I didn't look at him and walked over to the fridge, realizing I hadn't eaten all day. Sammy, sit down. I want to apologize for today. I took out some chicken and cheese and went to the pantry for bread. I know you're scared, and I know that a lot has been going on that you can't exactly relate to. He sighed. Anne. Anne had been depressed for a good long while, Sam. Over twenty years. Not a way on a person. I ignored him and continued making my sandwich. I was dying inside, wondering if I could even trust the man I'd called Dad my entire life. She was suffering, Sam. And sometimes people who suffer that deeply don't know of any other way out. She knew her depression was hurting her husband and her daughter, and maybe she mistakenly thought she was doing them a service. Mom's depressed. I said without taking my eyes from the cutting board. He sighed. Your mom's coping okay, and this is very different, Sam. Kimber's mom has been depressed since she was in her 20s. Early in her marriage, Anne suffered multiple miscarriages. Infertility can be very hard on some couples, and not even Kimber's birth could totally erase her pain. Fine. I'm tired, and I'm going to bed. Kyle and I are getting up early to look for Kimber. I threw the knife in the sink with a loud clang and turned to look at my dad for the first time. Please tell me you're still trying to find her. The sheriff stood up from the kitchen table looking as tired and disheveled as I felt. I promised Sammy. And I finally believed him. The next morning when I pulled up to Kyle's house, Parker came out to meet me. Hey, Parker. I said when I rolled down the window and cool morning air wafted in. Kyle's not here. He left around five. Stole my dad's truck. He's pissed, so you'd better go. Thanks, man. I said and then rolled up the window and took off down the street. I drove around all morning looking for Kyle and calling his cell, but he didn't pick up until around noon. Sorry, man. I, I couldn't sleep. Kyle sounded a bit more stable than yesterday. That's cool. Where are you at? I don't know exactly. A rare spot where I'm getting service. In the woods? Yeah, she's out here, Sam. Somewhere in these mountains. I can feel it. I know it. All right. Well, let me meet you. Okay, just come down to the West Rim Trail and I'll meet you there. I was only five minutes away, so I arrived before Kyle had time to get down in the mountain. Mr. Landy's red Dodge Ram was parked haphazardly in a no-parking zone, and I figured it would probably be towed by the time we got back. I very much doubted Kyle cared at this point. I crossed my arms and leaned against my car as I waited for him staring up the familiar dirt trail that now looked so foreign to me. When Kyle finally showed half an hour later, he was covered in sweat and dirt and dejection. So, I said, pushing off the car. No, nothing, man. All right, well, let's keep searching. We hiked miles and miles of the mountain that day, but we didn't find any sign of human life. And for the next few days, if the sun was out, so were we. Cow was growing more and more desperate, crossing onto private property to look for logging equipment and mapping out the county's many mines to search the abandoned buildings. But the mountain was big and the needle buried deep in the haystack, and as the days slipped away, so did Cow's sanity. Every time I saw my dad, he would give me a somber look and promised me that they were still working on Kimber's case. It seemed to me that even he was growing concerned. The Vistara house remained as empty and dark as the space between the stars above it. Eleven nights after Kimber's disappearance, I was awoken by the piercing, whirling, screeching sound of death at Baraska. I cried myself back to sleep, to the tortured den of Kyle's own agony next door. We had failed her. Kimber was dead.
Part 4 When I pulled up to his house the next morning, I could tell it was all over for Kyle. His skin had taken on a yellowed color, and his voice was flat and void of emotion. It's not over yet, Kyle, I said as he dropped into the seat next to me. Yes, it is, Sam. No, I don't believe that. Kimber's dad's missing too, you know. Maybe it was him instead that was... that... I couldn't bring myself to say anything anymore. You know we're living in hell. Drisking. It's hell in our reality. I couldn't disagree. The town I'd grown to love seemed so unfamiliar to me now. Whitney hadn't been an outlier like I thought. Missing people were the norm here. And that would make Jimmy Prescott the king. He's Satan himself. As soon as the words were out of my mouth, Kyle punched the car door, awakening from his deadened state with rageful vigor. I fucking killed Jimmy Prescott. Where is that motherfucker? You know he's involved in all this, Sam. You know? Maybe partially, I said, staring out the window. His dad created the town that bred this shit, but I'm pretty sure the Prescotts are just running drugs. You know, the powder. Yeah, and so what? He's recruiting people to be... to be drug mules or something? Probably. I agreed for Kyle's sake, though I didn't really believe it. The sound of the great beast machine of Baraska gave off the distinct stench of death. And though I knew that physically that was impossible, to smell death all over the mountain, it didn't change my mind about it. We drove over to 4th Street Gourmet Café and Bakery and went in to buy our usual provisions of rock stars and beef jerky. As I paid for the four-pack of cans and meat, I saw Mira waiting on coffee at the opposite end of the bar. I could tell that she was in a good mood, something that I hadn't seen much of since I'd started working for her. It was probably a good time to tell her I was calling out of work for my fifth day in a row. Hi, Mira. I muttered when I approached. Um, I can't come in today again. I got some really important... Sam, oh my gosh, how are you? Um, I'm okay, I stuttered. Good, she said brightly. Don't worry about coming in. I'll hold down the fort, and I'm sure I can call Emmeline in if I need help. But really, Sam, what have you been up to lately that's so important? My mind blanked just as I started to stutter out some bullshit about helping my dad. Kyle appeared behind me. We're trying to find Baraska. He said with all the gravitas of a eulogy. Ah, yes. Owen told me you'd asked him about that. You know that's just a story, Sam. That legend has been around since I was a kid. Yeah, well, we're looking for our missing friend, Kimber. We think maybe she's there. I trailed off lamely. Oh, really? I thought I heard the the Staros were staying with relatives in Maine over the summer. Mira shrugged. Anyway, good luck, boys. Thanks. Kyle's voice was sour, and I knew his patience was thin. When we got back into the car, we each popped open a can of Rockstar and started chugging. I knew better than to ask Kyle if he wanted to smoke, since I was sure he hadn't lit a bowl since Kimber had disappeared. He finished the energy drink in under a minute and crumpled a can in his hand. I don't like your boss, he said. Mira, why not? I don't know. She's just off. Well, she's been going through some shit. I wasn't going to elaborate any further. Why were you asking her husband about Baraska anyway? Kyle asked. I don't know. I was just making small talk, and I thought he might know. He seemed to know a lot about uh, other things. Did he? Nah. I took a long gulp of the sour drink and slowly brought it down to my lap as I recalled something Owen had said. Well, actually, yeah. He called it a Baraska. 
instead of just Baraska. You know, like it's a thing instead of a place. Kyle lowered his rock star. And is it? I don't know. I've never heard of it. I've googled everything weird about this town, but nothing ever came up. Did you spell it right? I don't know, I shrugged. Do you know how to spell it? No. I pulled out my phone. No, fuck Google. Kyle said, we need to talk to Catherine Scanlon again. That's what Kimber would say. He was right. Catherine Scanlon may be the most knowledgeable person in town and was probably the right person to ask. I pulled out of the 4th Street Cafe and prayed she was at her office this early. When we parked in front of Drisking Arts and Antiques, I was disappointed to see that the store was dark. Kyle pointed to a small cardboard open sign hanging in the corner of the door, and I prayed that it was for Catherine's office. I was relieved to find the door unlocked, and we hurried past all the antiques and blown glass to the back of the store, where we found an open door and Catherine sitting behind her desk. Boys, she stood up when she saw us. You're up quite early for summer break. How did the essay do? Uh, great, I said. Actually, we're here for more help. Personal interest, Kyle added. Catherine raised her eyebrows. Color me impressed. I needed to get right down to it. If by some small chance Kimber was still alive, then every second counted. We're here because we want to know if Baraska is a thing or a place. Catherine raised her eyebrow. I remember that legend as a kid. I'd actually have to tell you I didn't know if it wasn't for Wyatt. He knows so little about so much, she laughed. A sort of jack of all trades. Anyway, he told me an interesting fact once about Baraska. It's both. What do you mean? I leaned over her desk. Well, the term Baraska is just old, outdated lexicon. The word was used by miners to describe an underperforming mine. A mine, I whispered. Kyle shook his head. We've both been looking at mines. So all the mines in Butler County are Baraskas, I asked. Well, generally, it's only the first mine in the system to run dry that is called a Baraska. Do you know which mine ran dry first in our mining system? Kyle asked from where he stood near the door, repeatedly clenching and unclenching his fist. Uh, not off the top of my head, no. She laughed. I can look, though. I think I have those records here somewhere. Catherine walked behind her desk and opened a drawer of loose files. This is an odd thing to be interested in, for boys your age, but I guess I should be glad you two are so eager to learn, especially over the summer. Yes, ma'am, very eager, said Kyle. Is the Baraska the first mine that ran out of ore? Um, was that by chance the same one that those kids disappeared in? Or the McCaskies? Oh, no, I don't think so. That particular mine was the Southwest Mine. It was very close to town. I think it was one of the last to close, actually. Ah, here we go. This folder should have the information. Catherine spent far too long moving books around on the desk to make room for the stacks of papers she had. Kyle and I paced around the room nervously, trying to appear casually interested while the energy drinks started coursing through our systems. Here we go. The first mine to close was the North Central Mine, which was, yeah, actually one of the first to open. But where is it? Kyle walked over to the desk and braced his arms on it. Where is that mine? Um, Catherine pulled over a different stack of papers and started to fumble through it. After the longest minute of my life, she made a aha sound and pulled out a large yellow piece of paper that had been folded into a standard A4 size. She unfurled it on the desk and leaned over to read the markings. I could see from where I was standing near the doorway that it was a map 
and I knew we weren't leaving this office without it. Let's see. That mine was up further in the mountain, a little harder to get to. See? And she pointed at a small dot on the map that was at least four miles from where we'd been looking. Can we take this? Kyle asked. We'll bring it back. Of course. Uh, I'm sure I have copies. Listen, if you boys are doing exploring, I'm bringing my dad. I like. Oh, well, excellent then. You guys have fun. She yelled at us as we rushed out of the building. We didn't stop to answer her. Fun was far from our minds. It's, 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 it's so far from where we've been looking, Kyle stuttered. We need to go there now. We need to get a gun. A gun? Where are we going to get a gun, Kyle? From your dad. He's not going to give us a gun, man. Fine. Then let's scout the place first, and then we'll come back with a gun. That didn't seem like a good idea to me either, but what choice did we have? After studying the map for several minutes, we realized the easiest way to access the mine was still through the West Rim Prescott Ore Trail. We parked at the trailhead and made a familiar hike down the well-marked trail, and then up the beaten path, realizing that we'd have to travel past Ambercott Ford on the way, and I knew in my heart that we were on the right trail. We were walking the same path that so many people before us had on their way to Baraska, but what had they found there? We passed the treehouse, which was as silent as the morning. We walked on into the woods further north than we had ever been before, and soon we were flying blind, hiking in the general direction of a dot on the map and hoping we were still on course. Within an hour, I began regretting that we'd come without provisions and that we were exceptionally emotional and unprepared. By noon, we'd been hiking for four hours, and it seemed to me that we were lost. I tempered the welling panic with thoughts of Kimber and Whitney, and the answers to the mystery that had absorbed my life for so many years. Gao, for his part, said nothing, and kept his eyes straight, and his mission, his priority. And then, just as the sun teetered on the apex of the day, we saw an emptiness through the trees, and the hard lines of man-made buildings. Kyle quickened his step, and I rushed to keep up. When we finally broke through the tree line, I choked on my own deep breath, and stumbled back against a tree as I looked over the quiet encampment. A large wooden signpost that was almost as long as the entire clearing was still standing near the entrance of the mine. It had to be a century old, and though most of the letters had rotted off over the years, those remaining, I could guess, that it had once said, Drisking Underground Mine. What was left, however, was Skin N.D. M.I.N. The Skinned Men. I whispered, That way. Kyle pointed to the north end of the camp. We stepped out from the shadows and into the vulnerability of a clearing. There were several large buildings still standing, and the boarded-up entrance to the ore mine was set back in the mountain. We're not getting in there, I whispered. Let's try that building, he said, and pointed toward the closest one, which was the largest and at least two stories tall. We counted to three and then ran across the camp to the large wooden doors of the old building. They were cracked open, and when we squeezed inside, I had no doubts that death was indeed present at Baraska. We were standing in what I guessed was a refinery, and in the middle of the room was a large, silver, conically-shaped machine. A conveyor belt fed it into the room, and it had a sour smell. Even the dirt beneath our feet seemed to have taken on a crimson tint. This is the machine. This is where they take them, I said. People die in here. Kimber isn't here. Come on. I was only too happy to squeeze back out the door of the building and tiptoe around the side. We rounded a corner and almost ran into a recently waxed, shiny green truck parked against the building. 
This is Jimmy Prescott's truck. I breathed. I know whose truck it is. Kyle growled. We were now on extraordinarily high alert. Kyle dropped to the ground and began to commando crawl around the building. I followed him, waiting to hear a shout or a gunshot, but there was only the dragging sound of our bodies through the dirt. As we crawled around to the back of the building, Kyle turned to me and put his finger over his lips, then pointed at a one-story brown building that was only a dozen feet away from us. He got into a crouched position and moved as fast as he could across the gap between the two buildings. I did the same. As soon as I reached the wall next to him, Kyle whirled around and put another finger to his lips and then pointed up to a window directly above us. There were noises coming from inside, and even to me, a seventeen-year-old virgin, the sound of sex, were unmistakable. We could hear an animalistic grunting and the tired, objecting groans of an old mattress. Unable to help myself, I whispered, What the fuck? to Kyle, but he was already gone, all caution abandoned, running around the side of the building. I followed him in through the first door we came upon and was hit in the face by an invisible wall of the stench of great suffering. The smell knocked me back, but Kyle kept running. I followed him in past crates of ramen noodles, MREs, bottled water, and boxes I had no time to read. I crossed another threshold, and I was suddenly surrounded by people. So many people. I skated to a halt and realized I was standing in sort of a dorm. Rows and rows of beds on either side of me, with people strapped to them, some of them wearing dirty rags and some wearing nothing at all. Many seemed to be bloated, and I waited for one to call out to me, but they all remained silent, some watching me through tired, dead eyes, and others turning away their heads from me. Looking around, I realized they were all women, and the bloating I saw seemed to be pregnancies. Some were confined to their beds with straps, and others were not. I looked around the room for Kyle, and saw him standing a little further in the long room, looking back at me with the same confused, wild expression I was sure was on my face. I saw the realization cross his bewildered features and called out to him, but he was already running again. I lost him before I'd taken five steps to follow. I figured it was probably best to just keep running, spread out and look for Kimber. I didn't see her in this room and I was sure she would have called out to us if she was. I looked around for another door, and saw one cracked open on the left behind a row of beds. I stared straight at it as I made my way there, desperate to avoid the sad, desperate eyes of the women around me. First we helped Kimber, then we helped the others. I will come back and help you all, I promise, as soon as I find Kimber. Without a thought, I pushed the door wide open as soon as I'd reached it and found the source of the noises we'd heard outside the building. It was Jimmy, something I'd been expecting to see, but the scene before me was not. He was hunched over the bed of an almost unrecognizable, unresponsive Christy, treating her like an animal. She watched me through half-opened eyes, but it, she didn't call to me to help. I thought I saw a tear run down her cheek before she turned her face away from me to face the wall on the other side. What the fuck? I didn't even realize I'd spoken out loud. I'd never seen this depth of human suffering. Jimmy's head snapped around to look at me and briefly registered surprise before he smiled at me in a way that turned my insides to ice. He didn't stop what he was doing and I wanted nothing more than to run over and push him off of Christie, but to my utter shame, I couldn't force myself to come any further into the room. Sam! Sam! Kyle's voice echoed through the building and immediately cured me of my paralysis. I found myself running back into the miner's dorm and away from Jimmy Prescott 
and the long-suffering Christy. Kyle! Back here, hurry, please. I fucking... I found Kimber. I followed his voice through the maze of beds and rooms as a cacophony of noise began to follow me. Help us, please. Their voices were weak. There were maybe only a handful of girls yelling at me, but it sounded thunderously loud, as if filtered through my guilt. The weight of their misery dropped down upon me, and it almost pushed me into the rotting wooden floor. I will. I'll get help. I'll help you. I promised them as I followed Kyle's voice, still screaming desperately from an adjacent room. I sprinted across another threshold and saw him, hunched down near a corner bed, helplessly yanking on a leather strap attached to the post. I slammed into the bed and fell to my knees, trying to work out what he was doing and how I could help him. I tried not to look at the bed because I knew I couldn't see it like that. I couldn't bear it. If Kimber looked at me through the same accusing, empty eyes as Christy and the others, I might lay down on the ground beneath her and curl up into a ball. Go around the other side. Unbuckle the other two straps. Kyle had the high-pitched voice and wild, desperate eyes of madness. I ran around the other side and did as he said with shaking hands. Oh, boy. Jimmy's voice rang out from somewhere in the building. I had just freed Kimber's ankle and was working on her wrist. She whimpered when she heard him and buried her face in my shoulder. Do you think you're hiding? I know where to find you. I know right where I put that girl. Fucking kill you, Prescott, you sick cunt. I'll fucking stump all over your bones and bleed you out, you little motherfucker. Kyle lost all reason and strategy. He was filled with rage instead of fear, and it scared me even more. I pulled Kimber's wrist from the final strap and yelled, Go now! We pulled Kimber up off the bed and quickly realized that her legs could barely support her. She was heavily sedated and breathing weakly. We braced her on either side and moved as quickly as we could through the nearest doorway, away from Jimmy. We were in another dorm, though this one was filled with mostly empty beds. I could see sunlight shining through the door at the end of the long room, and we raced toward it as Kimber made little cries of pain. I didn't think my heart could break anymore, but I was wrong because in the next moment it shattered into splinters. I almost dropped Kimber when I saw her staring at me. Her eyes were hollow and uninvested, And when I turned toward her, she looked away immediately as if she couldn't stand the sight of me. Whitney. I said weakly, Sam, let's fucking go. Kyle screamed. I can't. I turned toward him. His tears ran down my hot cheeks, and Kyle saw her too. I can't. I can't stay, Kyle said, still moving toward the door. I have to get Kimber away from here, please. But he knew I wasn't going anywhere now. Good luck, bro, I said, and then we were both running in different directions. Whitney's hair was long, but it was thin, as was her face. Everything on her looked brittle except for her stomach, which bubbled out from her like an overblown balloon. She refused to look at me and flinched at my touch as I tried desperately to unbuckle her from the bed. I hadn't even finished the first belt, when I heard Jimmy walk up behind me. I didn't bother to look at him or stop trying to free my sister. I didn't know what else to do. I admire your grit, kid, Jimmy said, and then sat down on the bed beside me and continued to watch, giving no objection to what I was doing. You probably think your friends will get away, but there's no sense in false hope, is there? There's no sense in any of this. My voice sounded frail, and it cracked over the last word. Oh, you're wrong about that, Jimmy sighed. But just so you know, I've got Cleary out there looking for them already. People make a lot of noise coming down off this mountain. Trust me on that. Sheriff Cleary? I was desperate to keep him talking. Anything to keep him from trying to stop me. Oh, yeah. You know he was supposed to retire from the business, but unlike the previous sheriff, he kept a few horses in the race. Horses? Nothing made sense. 
Yep. Jimmy slapped the bed next to him. We called these buildings the stables, he laughed. I dropped the last buckle on the floor and looked down at Whitney. I expected her to spring up and run toward the door while I went after Prescott, but all she did was rub her wrists and itch her collarbone. Then she put her arms back where they'd been, turned her head away from me, and shut her eyes. I slumped down onto the bed next to her and picked up her cold hand. If she wasn't leaving here, neither was I. It was over. I sent a silent prayer up to a god I didn't know and wished my friend safety. Do you want to know what this is, Sam? I shrugged. It didn't seem to matter now. You should know. This might all be yours someday. You see, it's all about the babies. I stared down at Whitney in her swollen belly but gave no indication I was listening. You wouldn't believe how much money is in the industry. I mean, my dad was a smart man, and he knew we didn't have anything of value to sell, and back then the Prescotts were dirt-poor, out-of-work miners just like everybody else in town. He first got the idea when he sold my brother off to pay for the legal fees to fight the city. I mean, some people will pay five figures for a newborn, you know, even back then. And the organizations that buy them, well, they buy in bulk. But we still make a killing off them. And our overhead is very low, as you can see. Jimmy stood up and pulled a gun out of his waistband, then threw it on a bed across the aisle. You know, try to understand, Sammy. It's not just about the money. We use the stables for community services, too. Lots of people in town come to us, you know, ever since the incident in the 50s. I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't want to be here listening to this. I didn't want to see Whitney so broken, and I didn't want to wait for inevitable death. It was torture in its purest form. What are you waiting for? Why don't you just kill me? This isn't a James Bond movie. I don't care about any of this shit. Jimmy laughed loudly as if it was the funniest thing he'd ever heard. Kill you? Christ, kid. If I could, then I already would have, but I'm not allowed to kill you. I've been trying to decide if I want to fuck your sister right in front of you, though. She's not one of mine, but it might be worth it just to see your face. Just... Just kill me and let her go. Fuck, I'll kill myself if you let her go. I stood up from the bed, and Jimmy took two steps toward me and punched me so hard in the face that I thought I heard my cheekbone crack. I grunted and fell back down on the bed, fighting the stars and tears behind my eyes. I can't let her go, you little fuck. She's got one of our community service babies in her. Grace says she's got another week to go. Two tops. Jimmy looked down at Whitney and frowned. She's been putting out shit babies, though. And as soon as this one's out of her, she's got a date with the shiny gentleman. What the fuck does that mean? I yelled at him. And a loud ringing suddenly filled the room. Jimmy held up a finger and pulled a phone out of his pocket. I gotta take a business call. Two minutes and we can get back to our conversation. Jimmy walked over to a corner of the room, and I desperately started to pull on Whitney. We gotta go. We gotta go, Whit. We can't stay here. She kept her eyes shut and her body lax. Whitney, they're going to kill you. My head whipped toward the door as I heard a truck skid in the dirt just outside of it. Jimmy ended his phone call, and Killian Cleary walked in, pushing a limping, bloody cow in front of him. Lose something, Prescott? Where's the girl? Couldn't find her. God damn it, Cleary, you fucked us. Go back out there and find that girl. Jimmy snatched his gun off the bed and shoved it into the back of his waistband. Now listen here, you little shit, Cleary growled. I ain't your fucking employee, and I don't have all fucking day to play hide-and-seek in the woods. I'm telling you she wasn't with him. So I guess if you want to know where she is, you should get it out of him. Clary threw Kyle on the floor and spit near his feet. I gotta do your fucking job now? 
Jimmy walked over and, without any hesitation, kicked Kyle so hard in the ribs I heard some of them snap inside his chest. I tried to stand up, but I was still dizzy and still fighting off the darkness. Where's your girlfriend, Landy? Prescott raised his boot and then stomped out hard on Kyle's ankle. He screamed in pain. I can do this all day, kid. Clary sat down on a bed across the aisle and lit a cigarette, watching him passively. Jimmy pulled Kyle to his feet and then punched him hard in the face. A few of Kyle's teeth scattered across the floor. Tell me, you little cunt. Jimmy punched him again in the face, and Kyle went limp. You're killing him! I screamed and jumped off the bed, running blindly toward Jimmy in a red rage. Clary stood up and caught me with no effort at all, holding my arms down at my sides. He laughed. Cigarette still tucked into the corner of his mouth as I struggled helplessly against his chest. Jimmy had straddled Kyle by now and was rapidly punching him in the face and chest. Kyle was barely conscious and I prayed he'd pass out from the pain. After a full minute of this, Jimmy stood up and rubbed his bloodied fists. Last chance, Landy. Fuck you, Kyle said through a wheezing, rattled breath of air. Jimmy spat on him, raised up his foot as high as he could, and brought it down on Kyle's face with so much force that I heard his skull break. I sagged in Clary's arms, and he dropped me into a puddle at his feet. Jimmy bummed a cigarette off Clary, and they stood next to Whitney's bed watching me cry. Jesus, what a mess. After a few minutes, Clary flicked his cigarette out and pulled out his phone. All right, Sam, take your friend. I couldn't have heard him right. Fuck that. That little landy shit ain't leaving here. You want to clean this mess up, Prescott? I stood up and my knees didn't buckle beneath me. I'm not leaving without my sister. I told them. Jimmy laughed. Yes, you are, Clary said. If you want to save your friend's life. He ain't dead yet, Sam, but he will be soon. He tossed the keys at me. The road off this mountain is back by the refinery. I let the keys bounce off me and fall to the floor. Clary swore at me. I knew he was right. I was a coward, and I would leave my sister and all the others here just so I could get away and save Kyle's life. I picked up the keys, and then, without looking at the two men, I grabbed Kyle by his shoulders, and his head rolled back as if it was no longer attached to his spine. His face was a collage of pulp and blood, and I struggled to stay calm and breathe as I dragged him out of the building. Clary and Prescott watched me, taking drags off their cigarettes and saying nothing. I knew they were probably lying to me. Kyle would be dead by the time I got down the mountain, if he wasn't already. I opened the door to Clary's old Ford and pushed Kyle into the passenger seat, wincing as his head rolled around like a ball on a string. It took me almost an hour to get down the mountain, even though I took the overgrown road at the ridiculous speeds and did everything I could to destroy the shocks in the truck. I sped into the hospital's emergency zone and found a medical team waiting inside the door. It was clear that they'd gotten a call to expect me because they were already with a crash cart and an IV to push into Kyle's wrist. I left Clary's truck where it was and spent the next two hours in the waiting room, calling my dad over and over again and crying over an architectural digest magazine. No one came to take a statement from me or ask any questions. Kyle's mom arrived just before my dad and started screaming as soon as she saw me. My dad walked in behind her and had a deputy restrain her. He drove me home in silence, but I couldn't take it for long. Is anyone going to file a police report? Does anyone even fucking care what happened? Sam, he didn't turn to look at me. I'm doing my best to do damage control in the situation. But if Kyle dies or his parents sue, there's nothing I can do to keep you out of court. You think I did this? I screamed at him. We're not going to tell your mother, all right? She has enough to worry about. Dad, it's a 
Kimber, fucking Prescott, and Sheriff Clary. Yes, you arrived at the hospital in Killian's truck. We already talked to them both. I was so frustrated and full of rage that the next words came out a jumbled, stuttering mess that ended in a helpless scream. We pulled into our driveway and my dad turned off the car and finally turned to look at me as I struggled to catch my breath. Samuel, we'll never speak of this again, do you understand? Are you fucking kidding me, Dad? Kyle might fucking die. I saw Kimber. Enough! If you want this to go away, you'll keep your mouth shut about it. Make no statements to anyone, and I'll hire the best lawyer I can afford to clean up your mess. But you're not going to go to college until next year. I don't know why you beat your best friend almost to death. And frankly, I don't want to. You... Fuck you! I screamed at him and threw open the door to the cruiser. I ran then, away from him and the house and my broken life. He didn't come after me. Not that day or any other. Since everyone in town thought I was a violent thug, no one would let me stay with him when I called around. I eventually went to a motel far outside of town and drained the last of my savings from work paying for the room. I went back to pick up my car from the trailhead, but it was gone, and I hope it was Kimber who had it and not a tow yard. I read the paper every morning for some mention of Kyle's condition. I saw the Daily's birth announcement about ten days later. They had just had a son that they named William. The whirling, twirling, shiny gentleman lit up the valley with its stench and song of death that same night and Whitney was gone. It was the last time I ever heard it. I stayed in Drisking long after the money had run out, and I was sleeping on the concrete behind the motel. I stayed until Kyle was released from the hospital, a mute, empty-eyed, soulless vegetable. I went to see him once while only Parker was home, and threatened him until he let me inside the house. When I had assured myself that the Kyle I knew was dead and only his empty husk remained, I left his house and hitchhiked out of town. After I spent four drunken, drug-fueled years in Chicago, I came home one day to find a letter waiting for me. I didn't have a return address, but it was postmarked California. I knew it was from her before I even picked it up. She'd written so many of my assignments for me that I knew Kimber's handwriting better than my own. Inside it was a letter. THE letter. I read it only once, many years ago, until I sat down to transcribe it today. Kimber, I need to tell you some things before I go. I know you aren't going to understand why we did these things we did. Please understand it was all born out of love. At least it started that way. You're everything to me, and you'll always be my daughter. Do you understand? And I'm leaving this world because what I've done to you, not because of what you are. I don't want you to be upset about what you are, because who you are is beautiful. My love, this town has done horrible things, and all of us who live here are guilty. Read this letter and leave this place. I need to tell you all of this, I need to start at the beginning. Somewhere along the way, decades ago, the major population of Drisking became unable to bear children. Most people blame the town for letting the iron ore leak into our water table during the collapsing of our mines. This is the same water table that still provides the town water today. They were never quite able to fix it, and ore is toxic, and exposure causes infertility. The town did, and still does, suffer greatly from its effects. And the Prescotts, they solved the problem that no one could solve. It was an ugly, crass solution, but most people were happy to look away when they were able to raise families again. You see, they took girls, mostly women, from other places, and they impregnated them and gave us their babies. And the town came under the care of Thomas Prescott, when he started to sell some of the babies on the side for a profit to rich couples. 
and the sheriff, he helped him do this. But then an ugly rumor started that they were selling to human traffickers, and the Prescotts had to offer triple the price for girls. And in town, we began to murmur. But once we again turned the other cheek, when the city was suddenly flush with money because of how well the traffickers paid, people had well-paying jobs again and were proud to call Drisking home. So we said nothing, and those that did were taken to the mountain. Because that is where they do it. There's a place in the mountain where the women are taken. Kimber. Drifters, runaways, and if their parents choose it, sometimes the girls in town are even sold back. They arrive to sell the girls, and they meet them at a tree halfway between our town and their baby mill. Sometimes kids play there now. I think you've played there. The Prescotts and the Sheriff are the ones who impregnate the girls, and the children are named after them. P. Children for Prescotts, K. For Children for the Sheriff. And then, when the women become too sick or too old to deliver profitable babies, they're sent through a giant machine that was once used to refine ore. They call it the Shiny Gentleman. Their bodies are crushed, and the blood and skin stripped away, and what remains of them are their stolen children and the dust of their bones. And all that's left of their bodies is the powder that they spread over the mountain to hide our crimes. I'm telling you this, Kimber, because you are one of those children. Most of your friends are one of those children. Please get out of Driscoll before your father finds this letter. Run away and never come back, never speak of it to anyone. Their industry has deep roots now, and the traffickers have lofty connections. Don't tell anyone. Don't keep this letter. Don't look back. I love you. I'm sorry I have to leave you. We all have to answer for our sins, and I'm ready to burn in hell for mine. Love always, Mom. I hope you enjoyed Baraska by author Rebecca Klingle, also known as C.K. Walker. If you enjoyed that epic tale of terror, I'm pleased to let you know that the story you've just heard as well as an additional fifth part, which nearly doubles the length of the ongoing saga, has been produced as a full-cast podcast series, starring and produced by Cole Sprouse, in association with Automatic and Q-Code Media, and it premieres May 25th, 2020. So, if you can't get enough of what's going down in Drisking, Missouri, you're in luck. You can find the series simply entitled Baraska on Apple Podcasts and wherever podcasts can be found. Also, if you're a fan of Rebecca's work, do me a favor and check out the multiple volumes of her collections of tales entitled Cold Thin Air, available now on Amazon.com. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash ckwalker to pick up your copies today. Each volume of her stories contains a variety of bone-chilling tales written over the course of the past few years with something to love for everyone. Thank you for your support of the author and of indie horror. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts. And leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. 
or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well, at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014, and you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Gyrie. Until next week, stay spooky, and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jivey Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? (laughs) Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.